To celebrate publishing over 100 episodes of the Fishing the DMV podcast and surpassing 2,000 subscribers on YouTube, I am giving away a free guided fishing trip with Billy Coles of Smith Mountain Lake Fishing Guide Services. The giveaway will run through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th, and I'm going to give you three unique opportunities to win the fishing trip. Number one, the number one way that you can enter the competition is by leaving a review of the show at Apple Podcasts. After the review at the very bottom, comment hashtag fishing the DMV and you're automatically entered in the sweepstakes. Number two, commenting on every video that I drop from Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. And then at the end of your comment, leave hashtag fishing the DMV. And then you're again entered to win the competition. Number three, the final way that you can enter a chance to win is by ordering online from Jake's Bait and Tackle. Every online order through them automatically enters you with a chance to win as long as you leave the hashtag fishing the DMV. The contest again runs through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. Good luck. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. I'd like to know about how you guys meet, because Chris, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have been able to like get in contact with Mike. Well, and, and honestly, I remember Mike being on a guide trip with me and talking about guiding. Like, that was the majority of our conversation was about, yeah. you know, what what is this guiding thing? What do you like it? My dad and I are thinking about doing some guiding, you know, and he gave me this story about him and his dad and his uncle and all the time he spent on the river. And you know, that's a question I get a lot, right? It's like, you know, there's a lot of people who have questions about it, but Mike had a lot of good questions early on about, you know, how do you start this up? And, you know, can you give me any pointers? And it's like there are people out there that that won't want to help somebody. Yeah start up but i don't understand that i don't understand that that thinking it just doesn't it doesn't resonate well with me because someone's asking you a question about it they're passionate about it it's great wouldn't you rather have good people on the river or in your water system that have an idea of what they're doing and are being mentored even though they didn't need any mentoring but are at least being supported and mentoring by the people who have been doing it for 10 15 20 25 years to me that's if I have no other role, that will be my role in the next five to 10 years. Con so I want you to continue on that line about mentorship because I, I'm i trying to also get really involved with the youth and use this platform to help raise money for high school stuff and high school sports. And what's so funny is there's a, there's this old guard of anglers that do not want to mentor the next generation or they don't want to pass down knowledge. It's the knowledge of like, you got to figure it out. And you can see that when somebody asks on, on social media, cause that's always a great place for decent conversation. Um, <laughs> hey, like I was, well like, where, where should I go fishing? Or where can I go on the Susquehanna or Lake Anna? And it's like, go figure it out. You know, it's like, why is there that lack of mentorship in the fishing realm? I mean, I can take a shot at it. I don't know that, I don't know that there's not a great level of mentorship in it. Um, I, there is probably one of the most seasoned guides on the river. And I know that, that, you know, anytime that you're on the river for a long period of time, you know, you have people who love you and people that don't love you. Right. So, but I can tell you that when I started guiding 17 years ago, Ken Penrod, who probably has been guiding longer than anybody, on the river at least on the river in the springtime and he, he's very busy on other rivers and other other uh, bodies of water and he has plenty of people who are representing him on multiple levels on all over these fisheries right from the day one that i started guiding he came up to me put his arm on my shoulder and said if you ever need any help you call me right so i mean I can't tell you how many times in the early years when I would get there before he was ready to start, he would say, do you want me to back your boat in for you? Now, this is this might be something that doesn't resonate well with the younger crowd, but I think I think a lot of the people who are new into this think that they own the river and really don't, they have tunnel vision as to what they're looking at. They're not looking at this as being, even if there's 25 guides in a four county area. It's still a relatively small number of people compared to any other profession. 
So true. supporting yeah. each other, helping each other with engine problems. I got two calls today about engine problems, right? So who, if you can't call somebody, what are you going to do? I mean, how many times, I mean, I can't tell you how many times a year I'm called up to ask them an engine problem or a boating problem or, hey, I broke down, could you? And so I think people see me as accessible or approachable. And I like that. I, I like the fact that somebody feels comfortable to ask me for, hey, I, I, I heard you're using this product. I can't find this product. Do you have any extra you can spare? And almost, I would say 95% of the time, I've, I've always come up and said, yeah, here it is. You know, you're not going to find it anywhere, but you can find somebody who, who makes it. Maybe we both can get it from them. But it's just, I just don't, I think it's a lot of generational stuff where hmm. people feel they forget that someone else helped them, right? And I yep. think that's the problem is they, they've gotten very good at it and they got it very good at it because they put a lot of time on the water, but they have short-term memory and forget that when they were starting out, this person showed them how to use a, uh, a spinner bait. And this person showed them how to use a jerk bait. And this person showed them how to run this line, right? And yeah, they've learned a lot since then, but you, you, there's yeah. just time when you're on the water, you're gonna need help. And I just think that some of the newer people in this kind of don't wanna ask for help and they don't wanna give it out either. It's just that maybe it's a pride thing. I have no idea. I mean, we all have a level of pride, but to me, it just, I can think of the Penrod thing and you didn't know me from Adam. Uh, we had a, a, a few conversations that were very pleasant and, you know, I was pretty, pretty humbled that this guy was going to come up and, and willing to help me instead of looking at me as, a, as somebody who was trespassing on his property. That is a really good thing, like mentally talking about the mental side of it, about this idea of owning the water. And we see this all the time about on YouTube, on social media, we see the ugly side of it where it's like, well, this is my dock. This is my stretch. And I, I, I've always wanted to put like a GoPro on time lapse at a dock at Lake Anna to show you like that dock you thought was yours was hit like 38 times before you. Well, I mean, I mean, I've actually had people approach me about this is my launch or you're in my area oh, and really? the guys that are doing it. God. I mean, to be honest with you, I have photographs, Polaroids, you know, they don't even make Polaroids anymore. I have Polaroids <laughs> of me fishing this area when you were in junior high school or you were in diapers. I mean, I don't understand how this all of a sudden becomes your property. And I, I mean, people are kind of territorial and I do get some of that, right? You don't, you want, there want to be a, a little bit, but there's, there's, the river's constantly changing, right? You know, if the river goes high, you're going to go to some place. It might be somebody else's area because you want to put on, you want to put it on, on a, a different part of the river that might be safer because of flood, right? And so if the Juniata is high and that's your, that's the place that you launch from all the time, you may launch up river, it might be somebody where somebody else launches all the time, but you pay the same license for, for, for a fishing license that I do. Uh, and you don't own, I've never seen a deed to one of these, like these places. So it's not like, and they're going to say, Oh, you don't respect me for this. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's not about that. It has nothing to do about with that at all. It's just, it's just, you're doing what's best for your clients and they should do what's best for their clients. So if the fish are here and they're active where it's safer to launch from here, I mean, I just, I, I really try to understand how a launch that our taxpayer dollars pay for becomes somebody's business platform. And I've actually talked to the fish mission about it. You know, how do we, how do we resolve these silly issues? There's no answer. yet. But. Yeah. Makes sense. Politics. I mean, but, but <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's so important for younger anglers. And we, and we talked before we got started here about like, what can we, what information can you share to, to help people out? And I think it's the mental side of it, like in any sport where you put yourself in, in a box mentally, when you say like, this is my secret spot, this is this, this is that. Cause all of a sudden it's without the secret spot, you can't catch them. And then now you're externally lashing out at everyone else for why you can't have success. And I think it just hurts you as a fisherman when you try to put it into like this thing of like, my day will only work if I'm the only guy that can beat them to this eddy. And if anyone's there, now I'm completely screwed. And I think it's a very toxic way to look at it as an angler. You got to look at it. Yeah, that, okay, I, mean, I don't even know if it's toxic, but I've actually been approached by it. And, it, and I'll tell you what, it's like, so if it wasn't me in this spot, and somebody else in this spot, does that change your day? Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I was on the river yesterday and there was, it was, it was a Thursday. It was the first sunny day after a bunch of really cold, windy ones. And there was nine boats. There was nine boats where I was fishing. And did I want to get to the places first? Absolutely. Did I, did I absolutely not have a plan in case I wasn't? <laughs> I had a plan, right? So if, yeah. if, if the boat 
if one boat was on a spot, I would go to another spot. I mean, it's just, it's not what I want to do, but it's what you have to do, right? You can't crowd somebody. There's etiquette on the water and you can't, it's, they have every right, whether they're, whether they're guiding or fishing for fun, or this is, they have every right to be on the water. Right. So it's as, part of the game I, love to own, I would love to own my own ramp and I would love to own a stretch of the river, you know, and <laughs> this is actually a, a problem for another conversation, but waterways land rights are a big, big, big problem in this country right now because the laws are all old and they're all, they're all written when no one really thought about owning the water, right? Who cares if there's trout in this water? Who cares if there's bass in this water? And now all of a sudden they're bought up and people are trying to keep people legally out of a section of a free flowing river. And it's, it's, it's so, it's so, uh, like two weeks ago, I actually interviewed Rob Engel, and he's a he's a guy on the Upper James and the Jackson, and he told me about this thing called the King's Law from land that was bought by the king. And then if you float through that land, you can get fined up to a million dollars if you step foot off the boat or some crazy shit. Like that. I have never heard of that crap, but it's because that's, it's that's it's, wild. It's, it's insane. Some of these land laws. Yeah. So there's in the um, the ADA the, uh, the 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 there's a listing. Um, in the, it was actually in the publication, a magazine. I have to look it up, but it was either the July or August issue. And it literally talked about how complicated some of these things are becoming. Now in the East, it's not really as bad, um, but some of these laws have never been updated and they're, they're two interpretation. I mean, when was the last time we had a king influencing you know what we do in our land, right? So think about how long that is. And I mean, yeah. good luck with that, with that lawsuit. I mean. I think I think I'll be led dead and gone before that one's settled. But I'm just saying it's just one of those things. It's it just shows you how archaic some of this stuff is, and someone's going to have to fix it, right? Especially with all these kayaks in the water and all these, you know, everybody's recordage and being able to get it. I know that, you know, there's something there's there's laws about the the uh, the waterway and then the natural bank. You can't own the natural bank, but you can own the water that's out, you know, own the dry ground when it's not. So in high waters. If someone is standing on the bank of a river, they could be trespassing. I know that that's that's one of those in the books laws. Yeah. And I think it also comes down to the people too. I mean, a, example I have is back where I live. Um, these these people bought some land next to a little league uh, baseball field complex, and as soon as they bought the land, they started to complain about the lights. And it's like you did this to yourself. Why did you buy a property next to the little league complex and complain? Why do you buy land next to the river where people get off and then put up, your, you know, no trespassing, all these signs? Like you do this to you. And I think it also comes down just to the kind of people that you have nowadays that are doing this. Yeah, and I, and I know that. And I'll give you an example. So I have a friend who owns both sides of a creek that it was a that it was a trout managed managed creek, and he pick, put picnic tables up, he put trash cans up. He put um, stone in a drive near his driveway so people could park. Huh. And the first year it was an absolute mess. He said he had people driving down into the down into his field. He had people throwing trash 15 feet from the trash can, you know, buckets of worms, just an absolute mess. You know, they were just just fishing line all over the place. And he after cleaning up for the first 18 months, he just basically called the fish commission and said, You're no longer allowed to use my property to stock bath, stock trout. And over a course of a few years, he didn't have to put post signs up because there was no trout in his section anymore. And he just said it was a sad thing to do, but his, I, he didn't fish. Yeah. He was just trying to be nice about it, and the people abused it, right? I pulled into a, a boat ramp the other day. There was nine empty things of um, budget cigarette containers that looked like they were, you know, maybe marble knockoffs, but there was nine of them. So did someone – go there and fish for catfish or fish for bass and just throw them there. Someone drive by. And I mean, I picked them all up, but it's just, you know, how much is it that this, that this kind of stuff is going to happen and ruin our own abilities to approach, you know, landowners or any, if they're willing to do this on public property, or willing to do this on somebody's property who made provisions for you to enjoy time with your family, have garbages that he, he was going to clean up at the end of it, you know, and, and just some people, you, you just can't fix it. Right. I mean, there, that's a, it's a it's a problem with, you know, respecting the property that you run and not being lord over it. Right. So you have people who are move in, put a post aside. You can't even flow through here, which is ridiculous. And then you have people who are welcoming people to come and enjoy their day. But just please clean up after you, right? after yourself. And they don't. 
So how do you fix that? Right? It's, it's two different ends of the of the, of the, of the point. I don't know if you can. I mean, I remember as a kid going to farm ponds, knocking on doors, being like, if I clean up some trash, can I go fish your pond? You can't do that stuff anymore. No. You can't. No. And it's that's depressing, everyone. So we're going to switch <laughs> topics now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, yeah, it's the case. And guys, if you want to, kids, and I, Cameron, I know you're listening. You can knock on the doors, be respectful, guys. Pick up trash, because that pisses me off to no end when you see treble hooks and crankbaits around the boat ramp. Just pick up the trash, for God's sakes. Yep. Um. Mike, first time on the show. I'm really happy to have you here. Um, what? Tell the story of like how you got into this. Um, I pretty much grew up hunting and fishing my entire life. I mean, primarily fishing the Delaware River, and I mean, even with hunting season and stuff like that. You know, I mean, I I bow hunted, I turkey hunted in the spring, so <clears throat> my fishing wasn't like. You know, it was kind of like my secondary hobby and, you know, I was doing it, you know, I wet weighed in the Delaware, you know, with a little bait bucket when I was like nine, 10, 11 years old with my dad and doing some canoe trips and stuff like that. And uh, I would say it was probably about eight years ago. Um, I would probably I had my second jet boat at the time and and um, I was I was I was really, really big into um waterfowl hunting actually at the time, you know. Yeah. And uh same thing, man. I unfortunately I think social media got a hold of that and kind of destroyed the the uh how the waterfowl is, especially in kind of the area that I was, you know. Um so I kind of just um just said, you know what, I love smallmouth fishing more than anything in this world. So you know what? I'm gonna do this 365 days a year and failure is not an option for me, <laughs> you know. So um that's uh pretty much what I did, you know, and I kind of just um you know dug in and I just I just started fishing and, and I mean when I put in I don't do anything like half ass per se you know what i'm saying so when i say all in like this is i mean i'm eat sleeping and working and fishing you know what i mean so how many years ago was that and uh eight years ago is when eight. i kind of yeah just completely dove into it um and i and you know every year i kind of you know you the, the more time you spend on the water i mean is pretty much i mean the big golden thing and you know we all know this you know so i mean with all the water and year after year doing this i mean i was really figuring some cool stuff out and i mean it was neat you know and i mean meeting a lot of cool people along the way you know i mean especially chris you know i mean i'm beyond blessed to you know what i mean like having them in my life and you know it was it was awesome and and when we were taught, when we talked about it before, Chris, I, I'll never forget it. And we, uh, we were on the phone for like two hours and we, you know, uh, you know, talking about different wintering spots in the Delaware and stuff like that, you know, and we got hooked up, uh, you know, through fit, you know what I mean? That's kind of how, uh, how I met you. And, um, anyway, so we ended up trading trips and then I ended up selling my boat. So I'm like, Chris, I promise as soon as I get my new boat built, we're getting out together or it, remember and uh so that's actually how that works so my dad and i went out with you and out on the susquehanna you remember and then we didn't do our trip on my boat until the following year but that's cool. yeah that's kind of that's how all that worked out and you know one thing led to another and you know i mean like i said i'm i'm beyond blessed to uh to have chris in my corner you know i mean between my wife and chris i mean bronze back outfitters would not be kind of where it is if it wasn't for those two without a doubt you know so that was pretty much the last eight years and i would say susquehanna river wise i um i kind of dove into uh the susquehanna north branch first um just because it was i didn't have to kind of deal with those ledges and you know i mean the delaware river does have some shallow stuff and and whatnot don't get me wrong but that uh main stem susquehanna river i mean everybody's seen the videos and stuff i mean that's that's one gnarly place you know and, and you know it was super intimidating at first so like i said i kind of started up there and got my feet wet up in the uh, north branch and uh i kind of you know with chris teaching me about water levels and stuff like that you know and um I kind of just, you know, started launching different places and then just running. And of course, too, you know, the more you do anything, I mean, confidence, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's running a jet boat, you're fishing, you're, you know, bait wise, your confidence and 
it, it was the same thing. So I, you know, just started getting my feet wet and just, I mean, now I just, I just pick a launch and kind of go kind of thing. You know what I mean? So it's neat. So like I said, that's kind of like the last eight years is kind of, again. And now, I'll uh, add a little bit too. I mean, the, the, our Mike, Mike's first time fishing with me was probably his first time fishing with Susquehanna. Right? Yeah, really? it was. Yeah. Yeah, then, it was. And yep. then, um, we were talking about the Delaware and there's, there's a link there because I grew up in the, I grew up in the, the Catskills after my parents moved from Mount Union to, to the Catskills when I was a little boy and then spent my youth there and then went to school in Pennsylvania. I had never left when I got here from, since I was 18. And so the Delaware river was one of those places that I fished it up in New York. I fished it down here in the, 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 the Northampton area. I fished it where Mike is fishing, but I mean, I fished it for, 25 30 years before meeting mike who just got done saying that he really started to get into this eight years ago so, so cool. when we're when we're talking about the river and he we're going to go fishing we we went fishing was it december <laughs> yeah it was, was december it? yep i'll never forget it. Fishing. there wasn't anybody else on the river um and we're fishing together and um you know we're talking about spots and i'm thinking you know just <laughs> not really trying to be arrogant but i'm thinking Mike's got two years or three years on this river, you know, even though he kind of grew up fishing it. But I mean, I cold I water wise, boat. cold water, yeah, cold but water. I owned a jet boat at that point in time. I think my first jet boat was in the mid 90s, right? So think about that for a minute. So, yeah, you know, we're the Delaware, the Junior, the Susquehanna, all those years with a jet boat. And I'm thinking, I've got spots, you know, in my head, I'm just thinking, I must have spots this kid doesn't know, right? So we're fishing together, we're going to share some spots. And I think that day we probably hit 12. And yeah, I, I would think, say, I think that 10 of them were spots that we both knew. Hmm. And there was maybe only one or two that I showed Mike or Mike showed me. It's like it was, and there was, and there was 12 other spots we were talking about. It's like, I can't believe that you found that spot on a spot, you know, in, in the short period of time that you've been fishing it, because I can be honest with you. I did not, I did not come up to speed nearly that fast. I mean, I, it took me years longer to learn the same amount of stuff that, that my I kids. actually I actually remember that conversation because you were like, How long were you uh cold water fishing smallmouth for? I'm like, uh in like December, January. I'm like, I don't know, I would say two years. And Chris, I'll never forget it. You were like, So you're telling me that you learned that section from there to there in the last two years. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm, that's that exactly what I'm telling you. <laughs> we literally put in at the Delaware Water Gap. Now, Mike and I both know areas above it, but we chose the Delaware Water Gap yeah. and drove almost all the way down to Belvedere, which has got to be 12, 13 miles of river. It's yeah. got to be. Yeah, so solid. It's not a small piece of the river. I mean, and I've met people like this before. I mean, it, it, Joe Raymond is another one of these guys who he's very good at what he does. And if you really look at the history of him actually buying it and doing it, it's, I mean, he, he leaped mountains in, a, in an amount of time that it took me a decade that he learned in two or three years on his own. I mean, I'm sure he had help along the way, but there's just some really good, talented people out there that, that pick this stuff up. I mean, I don't really have that story. My grandfather floated the junior ad in the Susquehanna with me since I was old enough to be in a boat as, as long as I could bail, right? Because back then you know, there was no bill because we had we use a coffee can with a flat spot to bail. So I mean I grew up fishing in, in one, I'm telling you the God. truth, it's a good boat. Uh, I I didn't my mother didn't want to know. You know, I was probably, you know, nine at nine at the oldest. And I remember my mother saying, I don't even want to know. Don't even tell me what happened on the river today. I don't even want to know. So you know, it, it was just I grew up fishing from Mount Union all the way down into Duncannon. And, and then if we had, the, if the river was high and we finished up early that year, I loved it because, you know, there's a campground owned and the owner at the time um, uh, is the sun, the sun runs it now. But I can remember going to Cunningham's and having them drive us up every day to wherever we locked our, our wooden boat in. And then they would drive, we, we would, up the next day and float. I mean, they would constantly, you know, they did delivery for us. And I got to, got to learn the, you know, the area from Clemson Island down a little bit better as, as a youngster. And then I, of course, went to college in Pennsylvania. And then 
as soon as I had a job opportunity in Lehigh Valley, it's like, well, that's the one I'm taking. I mean, I had <laughs> an IBM job offered to me in the home in my hometown. It's like, I'm not taking that. I, I'm moving back to Pennsylvania because <laughs> I mean, the smallmouth fishing and believe me, New York has got good smallmouth fishing, but I was just in love with these rivers and never plan on guiding. I mean, that, that was never in my wheelhouse. The guiding thing just kind of came. I but, just like the fish. But Mike, you had to make that decision to like to really pursue this hardcore. How was that in the family? When no, you totally said- cool. I had nothing, nothing but support, dude. It was just, it was absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. I meant mentally for you. Like, was that hard? Oh. Be like, was there a lot of like you mentally pondering it? Like, okay, I'm gonna finally make this leap. Was there that moment that you had like running on a Ab- treadmill? Like, I'm gonna do this. No, absolutely not. You know what I said? I was like, you know, there's so many people in this world that have so many ideas, you know, and I'm like, you know what? What's the worst thing that's going to do? I'm, it's not going to work out. I said, you know what? I'm taking a leap. I'm doing it. And I was just kind of set on it. And, um, and I, you know what? <laughs> Hold on. I did ponder it just a little bit. Just I made a pro and con list, of course. You know what I mean? But, you know, I kind of looked over it and it was like, yep. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? I'm going to fail. I'm like, it's not going to happen anyway but you know just because i have so much drive and fire i said but yeah so i'm doing it i'm going to be i'm not going to talk about it i'm doing it that's pretty much was and there's always a risk whenever you turn something that's a passion into a business right yep so, yeah no that is I mean, true too yep i can tell you that because i started mine part-time right i mean i my big gig was writing i was going i was writing i've been writing for over 30 years right so my thing was outdoor communications. It was going to be, you know, magazines. It was going to be TV. It was going to be video stuff. That's really where my passion was. And the guiding thing I only got involved with because a friend needed a help and you had to get licensed to do it. And I did it. And I, it was one of those discoveries. Wow. I think I really like this. Right. Mm. It's like, I think, I didn't think I would like this, you know, but I really do like this. And I, we do a lot of uh, veteran events and those veteran events, you have to get fellow guys, Mike's helped us do it. And you get people who never guided before or never had someone on a boat that you know they literally had to cater to. And I'll have two different responses. One from a fellow engineer who basically said, I wouldn't do this if it was a million dollars a year. This is <laughs> this is just this is I don't I didn't they don't enjoy it. They liked being there to help the veteran, but to do this every day was exhausting. It was mentally and physically exhausting for this. And I would never I could never do it. I would want to. And I had somebody else who almost seemed like they would have the right personality for it came up and said, wow, I actually am surprised. I really like this. And I said, that's where I was. I mean, I enjoy being with people. I enjoy fishing. But the idea of being on a boat and not casting most of the time, I, mean, I would say 95 to 98% of the time when I'm on the boat, the only time I touch a fishing pole is to get it out, put it away, or fix, a, uh, fix something on it, right? Chris, do you have broke- to have that like genetic makeup to be a teacher? To almost well, make it work what, as a I mean, guide. It's funny you mentioned that at Bell Labs. My first two years, we taught. They had a lot of programs that they did for uh, the inner city schools. So we set up computer labs and taught. You know, computers for. I think I did it for two years. Took a break and then did it for two or three more years. So it's funny you mentioned that because that was a passion of mine. I mean, it was. I didn't. You don't realize it until you're in that role. Right. As a father, you teach your children as an uncle or, or you, you, you teach people. Right. But this is a great opportunity to get on the water and not panic or not get angry when somebody's in a hole that you want to be in or not say something negative about somebody who does something dumb on the water. Right. Not everybody that that wakes you means to wake you. Not everybody that that that, it, you know, I was that's funny. I was just talking to somebody the other day, they were very close friends, so I could be, you know, very honest about it. And I had, it was a very skinny island. I mean, literally the island was eight feet wide. It was probably 30 or 40 foot long, but I was fishing it with a client and somebody came, there was nobody on the river. Someone came all the way across the river to fish the other side of this thing. And I remember thinking about it. It's like, why would you come all the way over the side? Because eventually, because the river goes down, yeah. we're both going to be at the bottom of this and we're going to be throwing at each other's boats, right? Mm-hmm. So. I told my clients that there's so many more islands we can go to. We're just going to push off. You know, we'll fish it until I don't get, we don't get their water. We'll move it. But we literally had position. And I don't think the person did it on purpose. I think they just didn't think about it. Right. It's like, you know, the, you know, we, the river's three quarters of a mile wide. He came almost a half mile away to fish where we were fishing. It just seemed like a really weird move, but you know, you have a choice. You can take it to mean that, 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 that they did it on purpose 
or you can just chalk it up to just one of those fun things that happens on the river and you just move to another spot. Yeah, yeah that, that's so big. <laughs> the more I've done this and I've gotten to interview so many guides, that was the one through line is like the teaching aspect. And I really think that's important to bring up just for people to understand that as a guide, you're not out there at the front of the boat catching all the fish. You know, you are be you have to have insane patience and you have to have a passion for watching other people have success. And so when you're out there and, and guys, again, like always link in the episode description to both their guide services, you know, and, and you go out with them, understand that they're out there and their greatest enjoyment is to see you succeed. And, and it, just like your your favorite high school or college teacher, I think that's just very important for people to understand where your guys come from. Oh, yeah, man. I'll be honest with you. I like my biggest goal. I mean, I ask everybody, you know, like I touch base with everybody, you know, when they book a trip and whatnot. And, uh, you know, of course, if it's somebody new, you're like, what's the biggest smallmouth you ever caught? That's my biggest thing. So it's like, dude, if I, I and it, when they break a PB and it's and it, it happens, you know, and it, I get I think I'm more excited than they are, to be completely honest with you. It's I think I get more jacked up than they are when they break their own pb whether it's a four or five pound river small you know what i mean it's i get it's crazy man i have like a system overload it's just like yeah it's awesome now i don't know if mike did this but you know like i, I was never planning on being a guide right this is just one of those things that just kind of fell into place and seemed like a natural progression with the writing but i remember talking to my wife and saying okay here i've been out on all these trips with my family you know on family vacations all these guide trips it was saltwater freshwater i've owned a saltwater boat i've owned uh, I think 12 or 13 uh, motor boats, right? And I, I wanted to take a look at all the things that I did not like about my guide trips in the past with other people and make a list of all the things that I absolutely loved about the guides that I was with. Yeah. And surprisingly, one of, the, one of the things, one of my favorite trips ever was not necessarily a successful fishing trip. It was how that guy handled mm. a relatively slow day. I think we caught four fish. Now a couple were really nice, but we only caught four fish among the two anglers. And I remember thinking to myself, I've had days when I've had an incredible 40, 50 fish walleye day with some of the biggest walleye I've ever caught in my life. But the guy was so rude and so miserable the entire day, not just with us, but with other anglers for so there would be a boat flying across the lake a mile away. Oh, he's coming to my spot. It's like, and he was going to your spot. You know, and of course, he never did, but he was like worried about this dot that, you know, was coming his way. And, you know, or, you know, my brother and I did a lot of walleye fishing. And so we would show him something different. And rather than engage in it, he goes, Oh, you can't do it that way. That wouldn't work around here. So you catch a fish on it. Oh, it's only working today. Right. So it's just, it was just one of those things where <laughs> I try myself that when someone wants to bring up something rather than criticizing it off the bat, even if I feel it's the wrong thing to do, I'll say, hey, let's give it a shot. If it works, we'll stick with it. If it doesn't, let's go back to what I was trying to do, right? So you're just trying to, you know, not pretend like I know it all because I don't. I mean, there's, I'll tell you right now, I I learn something almost every single day I'm on mm -hmm. the right? So I try not to speak in these exact terms because – and it can change, right? You, know, you, you might say something and everybody thinks because I said it once, that's going to be, you know, that's going to be the written law. Right? <laughs> that so, is, and that's a great segue into probably the meat and potatoes, what people like to hear. And I don't know how many times I get asked about questions to ask guests of like, well, how do I do this? Should, when, what, what should I throw? Where should I throw it on, let's say a river system? And to me, it feels like it's almost easier. And I could be wrong. And that's why you guys are here um, to correct me. On a river, if you're looking at, at a gut of a river, you can fish the shoreline to the depths fairly easy, unlike if you're at Lake Anna or something like that. So are, are people too hard focused on where they should be? I mean, if you have, let's say, a major eddy, you can pretty much in like an hour figure out the positioning of the fish and then try to replicate that. So do people get too closed minded when they approach the water versus being open minded? Yeah, I, I want I want Mike to answer this, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to give you Mike a, a pointer. Let's let's talk about uh, the, not being able to catch fish on the bank after nine thirty in the morning. Yeah, no, exactly. And that was it. Basically, it it kind of uh, yeah. We touched base on this a couple weeks ago, Chris and I did, and then uh, it was basically my entire summer pattern on the Delaware River. Um, you know, I mean, I I was going you know to those shallower flats and some of those like shallower like underwater grass beds, and um, 
you know, <laughs> basically, you know, catch them first light all the way. Um, I would say about like, as soon as that, that sun got super bright, um, you know, I was kind of fishing that, uh, right around that four to five foot of water, you know, I was kind of following, following them into the depth. So by 10 o'clock in the morning, I was back fishing some, some of these spots in the Delaware I was fishing. I mean, I'm drop shotting at 10 30 in the morning in uh, like 15, 18 foot of water sometimes, you know? So it's like that big transition. Like I kind of followed them, you know, basically, you know, from that flat in for like, literally I would say a solid four and a half to five hours all the way back into um, that deeper water and, and those uh, secondary ledges and stuff like that. So to give you an example, uh, the Delaware River is really kind of a bank fishery. I mean, I don't, not, not, not entirely, but it's a very narrow river. Uh, yeah. places, and people get stuck on the bank, right? And so you'll have guys go, yeah, we were fishing the bank this, this morning and we really had them and all of a sudden the bike died. And I said, we mean the bike died, so we couldn't catch a fish. And I said, you know, they'll say, how did you do? I said, well, we had X number of bass today. So we'll, well, we'll have to do that. And I said, well, here's what happens. As the sun penetrates, you know, sunlight penetrates the water, you're fishing the bank, and all those fish have been there all night. They've been feeding all night. They're there in the morning. They know that there's going to be activity. As, yeah. as the day comes up, they're going to be feeding. All their senses are going. They're feeding, and all of a sudden, you get a bright day, and those bass in the summer – generally are going to retreat from the shallow shoreline to they might only go, you know, a cast away into the next drop into the next segment into the next shelf. So you probably were fishing the right spot, but your boat was over top of the fish. Yeah. And they just, even though you, you tell them that they, they don't, they just can't get it past their mind that there's structure under the water that they can't see and they have to back off. Right. It, but, is it, a, yeah. is it a hyper fixation? Um, and I don't know. Let's, let me know if you guys can can see the screen okay. Oop. Sure. Um, and, and just so, because like I, I get this yeah. question a lot and I always feel like, so if I told, if somebody said like, well, they were on the, the shoreline, like you said, and let's just take this part of, of the West Branch of Susquehanna, they would be probably like you said, they would only fish the bank. And if you gave them an hour, they would never be like, I'm here 10 minutes. It's not working. Let me sit. Let me just sit off here and fish more of the main, the main, what I would call like the main channel of the gut, or let me hit this island. If you tell them fish bank, it's, it feels like everyone's like, they'll just fish bank all day. And I feel like people don't have this, this thought in their head, almost like you're a quarterback and it's a two minute drill. It's like, we got to call audibles. And, And I feel like that's missing a lot in younger anglers is, you know, don't take, information like gospel okay okay this is a little this is a little tidbit that may or may not work but you've got to be willing to adapt one thousand right. and, and what they're doing is it's it's they're being reinforced by we had success on the banks we're going to stay on the banks so that reinforcement until something comes along to change it for some people they need somebody to say okay this worked for you then let's Let's just pause for a moment and just try moving off the bank to see if it works. I mean, it. There's I have so many examples of this this situation where once that light bulb moment goes on for people, they're changed forever. But until that light bulb moment comes on, it, it's not gonna it's not gonna it's not gonna work for them. So I had a young man on the boat today, and I say young. Anybody under thirty four years old, anybody that's young. <laughs> I know I'm getting old. I'm showing myself, and I and uh, just a, a marvelously wonderful person who fished a lot of his youth with an uncle, and 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 he he ended up rediscovering his passion two years ago, and he's crazy <coughs> about fishing, and he wanted to learn how to fish jerk baits today. Hmm. So not being a cold water awesome. anchor, even though today it was forty one point eight degrees in the morning and forty three at the at the end of the day, not necessarily super cold, but not what I would call balmy. He was moving his jerk bait way too fast. And I said, I'm not saying you won't get any fish today, but I want you to see how slow I'm moving this bait. So I cast out there and I'm talking to him. And I said, right now, I'm thinking about my donut, my coffee. I'm paying attention to my rod, but I'm not moving yet. I'm trying to think about anything else. So I don't move. And all of a sudden my rod, you know, comes almost flying out of my hand because the fish hit while the bait was basically doing its own thing. Right. A mega bass designed this bait to do some pretty cool stuff. I don't have to do all the work for it, right? So, you know, that happened probably four or five times before he realized. And then he said to me, I wasn't doing anything. 
And I said, that's what I've been trying to distract you all day with. Right? <laughs> but I'm asking you questions about things. It's so that you stop doing this every three seconds. So it, when you have that light bulb moment, he went from catching a fish to like dominating the, the areas we were in. He was reading the water, you know, and I was coaching him like, if you call, if you threw in here and had a strike, next time you want to throw to the exact same spot, work it the same way. And if you get a strike, keep on going back to the hole, back to the pool, back to the gold mine till you get it. When it stops, we'll move position, we'll change maybe color, we'll change depth, we'll change whatever we're doing. So it's that light bulb moment that if people are given the opportunity to, to see that light bulb, <coughs> it'll change them. But I can tell that people could watch this thing and, and Mike and I can say, hey, at 10 o'clock, move off the bank. They move off the bank, don't have success. They move right back in the bank and, and yeah. because they know that they've had success there in the past. And eventually, you know, they're going to catch a few fish. But until it happens a few times, the reinforcement of what has worked in the past is going to be the thing that, that holds them to the bank. History paralysis. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 100%. Mike, did you send out to that? What's that? Oh, I thought, sorry. I thought I thought you were no, saying that. Yeah, no, off. I just said yeah, one hundred percent. I yes, one hundred percent. I agree. Chris, you said something about a gold mine, and I really because I'm when I talk to high school kids, I, one 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 belief I have is if if you have an area that you think you have fish, and they're not biting the way they were specifically. So, and I'll relate it back to a lake. If you're in a creek and <coughs> they were on docks and they're not there anymore, it doesn't necessarily mean they completely left that whole creek. They repositioned somewhere else. So instead of running to another place of the lake, if you still think there's fish there, fish different things in that area, repattern them, and then move. When you said earlier about the, like, if you're on the gold mine and you're readjusting, is that a general good rule of thumb? Is if there were fish here yesterday, fish around that area in different areas, maybe a little bit deeper, maybe a, a little bit shallower, before you completely run somewhere else? Uh I yeah. say yes. Yeah. I mean, so I can give you a perfect, a perfect situation in just the last two days. So I felt that I got my rear end headed to me yesterday because we only had about 30 bass in the boat in a six hour period. Now that's still five and a half. 30. <laughs> it's not the end of the world, but I just felt that I had more, there was more in my tank. There was more in my anglers. There was more that I could have done. And, you know, I was fighting a little bit of, you know, they were a little bit reluctant to throw certain baits, you know, because they really have that, that comfort throwing the, the tube jig and this river's full of crayfish. And everybody talks about crayfish and it's got to be the bait. But they just really didn't want that pattern, right? Where we were fishing, everybody I talked to in the river and I have a huge group of people we talked to. Nobody was killing these fish on tubes. They just weren't. They weren't on creatures. They weren't on anything. But they're really focused on minnows now because of the, the way that these uh, emerald shiners are in the river right now. So... I finally was able to move them off of, I know you want to throw this, but I think they're eating this today. So we can force feed them tubes or you know, jigs if we want to, and we're going to catch a few fish, but I really want to, I really want us to do that. And they weren't where I expected them to be. Hmm. So at the end of the day, when I was, listen, guys, we've tried everything else. Let's try this, that we found the bass were in our area, but just a little bit different current structure than what we were fishing so you know it was it was march 16th or 15th or 14th or whatever we were out doing this it mid-march it was normally out of any other year that i've been underwater this is where they would have been but because of this warmer water you know and it's been warmer longer even though it's not necessarily warm now it's been above 36 degrees for almost ever all winter long yeah and you know since the first couple of days of january i believe and it's been just wonderful fishing conditions. And even though it is this day on the month on the on the calendar, these fish are not acting today like they would most normal years. And you have this sometimes. And yeah. so it's being able to adapt to it when you know you go out and you have 70, you have 50, you have 65, and then all of a sudden you have 30. It's like, what am I doing wrong today? What do I need to what am I doing that I need to do different? So there will be certain days when you know the, the bass will get you. Right. You, you know, you don't get them. They will get you. Yep. And it's just I stumbled onto something yesterday and today turned it into twice as many bass. Or more, right. So it's just being able to I know they're here. I know what they're eating. I just can't get them to eat what I'm throwing right now in this spot. So the only other choices are to change size, change color or move locations. Right. You can change baits if you want, but if they just hadn't they hadn't been worked. And I was pretty confident that it was my location 
not my color, not my size, not my bait. And I would, and I ended up being right, but it took, it didn't happen in a matter of minutes. It took hours to figure that out. And then once it was there, that pattern held, you know, that pattern held all day. Not only for me, but people call and said, what is going on? I don't have a fish in the boat yet. I said, Hey, do X, Y, Z, call me in 10 minutes. I get a phone call in 10 minutes. We got six bass in the boat. It's like, yeah, I wish I had figured this out earlier, but rather than having you struggle all day to find it, here's what pattern I have working. And I know that down the road, that person I called that I gave the pattern to is going to call me up with a pattern. And that's one of those cooperation things mm-hmm. that I think it's so nice to have when you have yeah. people on the water, right? We're all expected to tow somebody in when their boat breaks down. But if they're having trouble putting fish in the boat, we all ignore them completely, right? So I just don't, I don't buy into it. It is interesting because like I, I come from a, my, my background was fishing, you know, high school and college tournaments. I had a big boat. I had the motor. And then this past year, I decided to get into the whole kayak thing a little bit. And I had to I, I had to change my whole concept of practice and how I break down a body of water because I didn't have a 250. You know, yeah. you had to pick your spot and sit. And then after talking to Nolan Miner and Jeff Little, it, it really made me realize like how many fish are in areas and our boat style almost is bad because it's like, well, if they're not biting, we'll just go run. And when I was yeah. in a kayak, I had to pick an area. Okay. We talked about this personally, uh, not on, on air at any point in time. We talked about this, I think, last year about how I think that I was a better angler when I was in a tiller prop with a prop guard because I was forced to fish this area mm-hmm. and I knew I was stuck in this area, right? I had to get back. And now with a 200 or a 240 horsepower engine in your boat, you know, I sometimes, I mean, I thought about today, how many fish am I running over to go to the spots that is part of my milk run? You know? I've thought, I've thought about that uh, uh, hundreds of times. I, mean, just, I, I think you're right. I think that, you know, a lot of my, I tell people who are bank anglers to guys who wade or the guys who kayak anglers, they come on my boat and I, I flatter them a bit and say, you know, I honestly think you guys are some of the best anglers out fish yeah. because you guys yeah. are not afraid to break down every piece of a piece. Of, of a structure because yep. often you're limited to it. You're limited exactly. to range. You're limited to, I can only fish this bank so far. And you'll break down, hey, you know, right down to reading the water better because, you know, you your milk run is a much smaller area than, you know, maybe the 12 miles that I happen to run on the north branch during the day. If I get tired and, and, and want to just put fish in the boat, I'm going to make that journey. Yeah. And I might not have to. Yeah, I break it down to, and I, what I tell people is like, it's the difference between the American way of fishing versus the Japanese style. Because I am fascinated with all these these phenomenal Japanese anglers that come over here and they fish around a boat ramp during a Bassmaster event and they they win or come in second place. And they're used <laughs> to being like, well, we have like one lake in our country, so we don't have to move everywhere. Yeah, and, and, it, and they fish close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. And, and and I had I had Scott, who uh, the Nico Bait rep, and he actually was over in, in Japan for a while living there and he told me like yeah their culture is completely different how they look at fishing how the idea is like you you don't you don't move to find fish fish are there you just got to figure it out and that blew my mind when you think of it that way it's like it's almost a cop out sometimes not always when you have a big boat and the guys that have a jet boat or just a regular boat sometimes it's a cop out to leave you got to sit in an area don't waste time and then make those adjustments and it'll make you a better angler yeah, and again, yeah. I was talking about it personally because, like I said, I think I was more of a complete angler when I was focused on this is where I'm going to fish, you know, and now having the ability to literally run, I mean, it's nothing to run 15, 60 miles in a day, right? There's nothing you want to do that. Yeah. As a matter of fact, on the North Branch, I think mine is like nine or 10 a day. So it's part of my, part of my run, right? Because I want to fish the water I want to fish and I don't, I don't want to have to go through slow periods of the day. Or if I find a certain structure that I, that, that I know they're going to be on, I want to go after it or if there's fish size. And I remember fishing with somebody who says, why don't we just fish here? I said, oh, we can. It's just, it's all, it's always supposed to hit or miss. And then it was a hit day. And he goes, we, it, this is why we stay in these places. It's like, I know, but you come back here the next time you're here with me, that this might be a miss. We have to have the ability to run and do it. Mm. But a lot of these guys who are used to being in kayaks say, no, this is my spot. I'll fish here for four hours. And I'll go four hours. <laughs> you know, I'm four hours. <laughs> you're on fish today. Right? You're on fish today for an hour. I did move the boat for an hour, and it was a pretty consistent catch. And I felt this is a new client. 
I got to move the boat because they're going to think that I just fished this one spot. But but you, that that's it. Like when I when I'm pre-fishing for a tournament in my boat compared to a kayak, I get that feeling in my head. Well, I, I can't just stay in one spot. That's weird. Like I got to use the engine. And it's such a weird thing that you, it creeps into your head and your strategy. Like, I got to move. Yeah. Now, Mike moves. <laughs> yeah, I'm a I'm a runner and gunner, man. I I yep. I find him active fish, and I'm off to the next set. You know what I mean? Like, I'll, yeah. yeah. And I, there I, is I, time. I, certain. Hold on, though. Certain times of the year, like <laughs> there's certain. Hold on, there's an area, Chris, in the Delaware that I will spend a lot, <laughs> a lot of time in because I know what lives there. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, I yeah. And so, yes, there are certain certain areas and and whatever definitely that i would definitely you know kind of camp out in per se i guess and really really fish it thoroughly angles the whole nine yards you know but i mean summertime wise i mean i'm kind of running and gunning like tailwater or you know a certain underwater grass beds i like to fish and you know what i mean but I, but yeah so i'm kind of a half and half split actually now, one thing that was very interesting, and guys, this is why I, why I always ask when I ask you like a simple question, because I really think um, the better you get into something, uh, you really lose the ability to always sometimes explain the simple stuff, because the more intelligent you get in something, stuff becomes instinctual. And so I asked the guys, like, what is a simple question I could ask these guys? And he looked at me and said, like, I've never been to the Susquehanna before. It's big. How do you break it down? Like on a map. I was like, damn, you know what? That's a that's a really good question. And, and you talk about the North Fork, the South Fork, the Juliata, and, and I, just a quick little snippet. And I got Google Earth and Avionics up, so you tell me which one. If you start from the, the headwaters all the way down to the dam, like how do you, how do you break it down into sections? Uh, I mean, the, the, the sections of the river are all very, very different, right? It's almost like three or four different rivers forming one giant river. So yep. I, think, I think to some people, the main stem is daunting. I remember, you know, fishing with somebody. I'm talking 30 years ago when, you know, when I had my first jet boat. It was close to that, 27, 28 years ago. And um, we always fished the Juniata out of my prop boat, you know, with had a little rock guard. And I said, we need to start, you know, fishing. When you come up, we're going to fish the main stem. We got out there. He goes, where do I throw? I said, what do you mean, where are you going to throw? He said, he said well, we're usually, we fish the Juniata, we fish most of the banks, we fish dead center of the river. Here, where do you, it's, it's three quarters of a mile wide. How do you know how to break this down? Mm -hmm. I said, you know, back then it was, you know, it was a summertime. So we were looking in grass beds, we were looking at, you know, rocks and in current. It was just one of these things that you just had to look at it as a smaller river. I mean, there are days, and Mike can, can uh, attest to this, there are days when, the east side of the river just fishes better than the west, or the west side of the river just fishes better better than the, the east. Yeah. And a lot of my time on the river, like today, I spent most of my time in the middle of the river, right? In a section, in a ledge group or in an island group of sections. So I think it depends on the time of the year um, and what the baits are, you know, that you that you want to throw. And um and I'll even add wind direction because it's a big river, right? So people will call me up two weeks before a trip and go, where are we launching from? Because a lot of guys have a place they launch from every single time. And I said, I'd really rather get a feel for what kind of water they're in, you know, and I don't mean what, you know, they're in, I don't mean freshwater versus salt or cold water versus or east versus west, but I want to know what kind of structure they're on. Then I'll pick the wind direction, the best location where I can put you on these fish in that wind direction so you can concentrate on what we're fishing. And then we'll we'll go to that area. So if you'll give me 15 minutes either way of your drive, you know, either 15 minutes longer or 15 minutes shorter than you know, one location, then I'll be able to pick a better location that we can fish from. But from a new person, if you're going to break down an area because it's such a big river, it's easier if you tell us, I want to break the Harrisburg area down. How do I do that? And then we can talk about the time of year, you know, the wind direction and, you know, what you want to throw. Are you after numbers? Are you after size? You know, are you, are you in a kayak? Are you in a prop boat? Are you in a, a jet boat? And then you can kind of give them a better, you know, a better view of how to break down a specific area but anything 30 to 40 miles north of harrisburg and 
I'll say 20 miles south is a you know a big part of that river that's rocky and and it's like it's it's you could spend a whole year out of that launch and not learn everything that you need to learn. Where does the Juliata jump in? So the Juliata is the second largest tributary of the 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 Juni of the Susquehanna. So I don't consider the North Branch as being a um, a tributary because when I was a kid, the North Branch was called the Susquehanna. So you know, the, the the West Branch has always been a, a trib, which is the biggest. You know, the biggest if you, if you discount the uh, North, and then the Juniata would be the second. So it comes in right above Dun Cannon, right at Dun Cannon, it enters into the river. So right here, this one, or exactly right. So it, Every and it is it is in itself it's a legend. The, the last fifteen miles or so of that river is very similar to a miniature version of the the main stem. Hmm. It's got grass beds. It's got ledges. It doesn't have that many islands, but it has scrubs. It's got, okay. but it's much 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 narrow. That's a great photo because you can see how much narrow it is. Yeah, right? It's insane. So yeah. it's very popular because. It is easier to break down. Ah, okay, that makes sense. That makes so yeah. much sense. It's easier to break down, and if you look at the curves in it, it's easier to get out of the wind if you need to in certain areas. That's why everyone talks about this river. Okay. Yeah, and to be honest with you, certain times of the year, its population of bass is unmatched by any one of the other tributaries. Why? Bass love to breed where they were born. And they, they will tend to go to creeks and bigger tributaries, right, rather than, than to breed in the main river. So the Juniata has always had a great population of bass. And come spring, when these fish start to migrate into their areas that are going to spawn, you know, that two to three month time in the spring, the population in the Juniata might double. Yep. Right? You could fish the Juniata in April and May and think it has, you know, a fish per square foot and then come back to that river in August and go, where did all these bass go? Yeah. Because it literally has a population that, you know, it's, it's like uh, the Florida population, right? But there's a two to three month period in the Juniata where that, you know, that first 40 miles of that or last 40 miles of that river is just loaded with fish. I mean, right. that makes sense. I mean, a comparison, guys, the, for, the, for the individuals that aren't around here is like Matawoman Creek in the Tidal Potomac, which is one of the biggest spawning areas on the planet. And it sounds like Juliet is kind of like that, where it's just one of the best it is. spawning. And the spawning on the river, the spawning event itself is very short, right? There's multiple ones, but it's yeah. a very short period of time, right? If you're looking at a specific bass, a specific male bass, his event is very short. But there's two or three of those events on that river during this period of time. So trying to time the spawn, believe me, when the fish are thinking about spawning and procreation, they're not thinking about eating your bait. And honestly, unless you hit the bed when the female's on it, the size of the bass that you're going to catch is going to be very disappointing. However, if you're in the river when the bass are pre-spawn and they're feeding, right, they're, they're feeding voraciously, that's when you're going to get that fish that, you know, is going to break, you know, it's going to be a citation glass fish. So you have a really good chance of that. Right. So it's just, it, and these fish exist on the main river. It's just that you're in a smaller area with a, in, in that smaller area is a greater number of fish, you know, per gallon of water, if you will, or per mile of river. And it's, it's only, I don't know. It's, it's only I mean, at its widest point, it might be a 20th of a mile. So it's more like the Shenandoah River almost. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I would say so. And it also has better depths than the Susquehanna. I mean, the Juniata does is very shallow also, but it also has a lot of deep stretches. So it, it just it's a great fishery. It's a, it's 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 difficult in the summer because it gets very weedy and grassy. And I think the population of bass drops, as I mentioned, and access is a little bit more difficult. Right. But in the. This time of year when the water's a little higher, that, that last, I don't know, 20 or 30 miles has got a lot of fish in it. I think it carries yeah. a Susquehanna. I think, you know, it's just like all these other creeks, right? You have Sherman's Creek and you have, and you have all these creeks everybody knows about. And, you know, I, it's fun to experience it a couple of times, but those creeks can be, you know, that may not be your cup of tea at times, right? So I think if I have a choice, the wind's not blowing. If the bass are biting someplace else, I'd rather not be in the creek. 
But if it's a day when it's the wind's blowing 25 miles per hour and the clients really want to be out fishing and the only wind break that you have is the mouth of a creek, you're probably going to fish those creeks because you just need a break from that wind. Right. So, or, or the river could be up high. So you're pushed into these, these areas. So you just make use of these areas and those areas do carry the population of the fish because they, because the, the flooding on those rivers is quick and over, right? The, the smaller the flow, when it blows up, it, it loses its water first, right? The big river is always the last to lose its water. So if that river floods during one of the many, many spawning classes, right? So if they, if we have three spawns from end of March through the first or second week of May, we have three different classes going and we get a flood during one of those, it's likely that those bass are not going to the fry or the eggs are not going to survive during that time because when the river comes up, it stays up for a long time. Mm. But in these smaller flows, it may blow up for a little time, but then it's gone. Right. So you don't. So does that you mean know, you should always target going up river after a, a major high water event? So if it rains hard on a Saturday or Sunday. Uh, well, I'm not giving that one away. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, all, all of us, every one of us river anglers are looking at, we're, we're looking at the gauges. For a good example, the river's going to go up this weekend. It's probably a false alarm, but New York got a bunch of rain and it's going to go up to, you know, almost four feet over the weekend, if it's, if it's real. So if that happens, we all have a plan A, B, C, and D, right? If that happens, right? But we're all looking, and I can tell you that Mike and I can say one location, but I he would laugh at me for saying, I'm not going to say it. But we would say we're going X. Yeah, it blows up because we know it's the very first place that this place is going to go. And I, I tend to, I like the rise, so I'll fish the rise here. And if I know I can chase the rise down, I want to get the rise. You know, I, I might go up to the north branch and hit the rise early, and then I know it's going to be a whole other day or so before it hits Harrisburg, and I'll run down and fish Harrisburg a day or two later, so I get that rise. Mm. If clients are willing to travel and boogie, you know, we can hit those places because it's not the idea of fishing high water. It's these fish rushing to the safety zones before the water gets all turbid. Okay. So they don't they don't move when it's 14. They'll move when it's going from 10 to 11. And if you can be there at 12 to 13, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be offering them the first food they've seen since they moved. What about, what about 13 to 10? On that, when that water pulls That's out, the hardest for me, honestly. I mean, I, I think receding water is one of the most difficult things to master. But that's so because on tidal, it's almost like the flip. Like you know, when that tide yeah. pulls, you know where they set up. It's that's fascinating that on a a non tidal river, that's probably the hardest thing. Whereas on a tidal river, that'll set up for a good day. I think the difference is that the tides come in every forty eight hours, right? Depending on where you are, right? If you're on the Hudson River, it comes up three or four times a day, right? So, wow, I think it's because they're used to it. So during a flow, it in the winter time, if the river goes from fourteen to ten, or let's say that the, we'll use the Harrisburg gauges, it goes from seven to five. In the winter time, they might not move at all because the water's cold. They don't want to move. There's not a lot of energy. But if you are in guide season, which for me is, you know, March, mid-March through uh, December, the water's warmer and they have a lot of energy. So as soon as that flow gets to a point where they're comfortable based on the time of year, the, the, the turbidity of the water, the temperature of the water, they can start dispersing. And so you had a collective group of fish on this piece of structure and now they're dispersing. So you went from literally fishing in a pond, you know, or a bathtub shaped place. It's now the size of half the river because they can be anywhere. So you got to go find them again. And generally when they're moving, it takes them hours to move. It could take them a day. And when they're moving, they're not eating. Mm. Like if, if fish are on the move, you know, they're generally not stopping to get, you know, I'm not saying they won't eat, but it's, it's tough to stop at one spot while they're moving and catch a bunch of fish. And that kind of leads into, I guess, our next topic that we really wanted to cover. Whoopsies, I get, as I get this up here. Um, I always find this stuff fascinating when it comes to precipitation levels, historic precipitation levels, historic temperatures, the moon, all that stuff. And and I, we, we, we briefly touched on it, but I think this is fascinating. When you look at on the right side of the screen, you have 2022 weather patterns. Uh, 
on the left side, you have March 2023. It has been ridiculously warm. It's been over 32 degrees. Uh, and I want to make sure we just hit this home. Like, how does that affect the fish? And how much of this matters compared to the increase of light every every day as we get closer to spring? Which one is more important? Mike, you want to take a stab? No, go ahead, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's a lot of variables now that are a bit different than they would have been X number of years ago. And I, I hate to constantly say it because I don't like reading the signs myself when service is being blamed or product, the lack of product available on the shelves is being blamed on an event that happened in 2020. <laughs> there seems to be more anglers today, you know, this year, last year, last two years, than I can recall ever seeing before. Um, a lot more active. And I think it's partially because many people are working from home um, and they have the ability to get into their boat at the end of the workday and not have that travel time to and from work. So their workday ends at three o'clock. They could be on the river at 3.30, right? Versus driving all the way home, hooking the boat up, right? They could be, they could have their boat ready to go and they could be on the river. And so I think this year for me in all the years, and I usually fish year round, I think I've seen more boats this year during January, February, and so far in March than I have ever seen. Even during the COVID, uh, fishing is an approved activity type time, right? So I think that that's one of the things that makes it a little bit different. You know, when I, when I look at this, it was an ex extremely warm year. People were fishing, ev I mean, Every time I went out, I saw other boats. There was no time. I mean, that's not normal for wintertime. Usually I can go out mm -hmm. in the wintertime and go to a launch and see my mud tracks or my foot tracks going down to the ramp, you know, from two days earlier when I was there. And now you go, there's three boats here in January? How, how is there three? And, and on the way up, I passed two other launches and there were two or three boats in those launches. So people like me, are going to take advantage of this great opportunity to fish because it's it's warmer. Interesting. What effect like it has on the on the bass? What happens effects it has on the ability to you know will 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 spawn happen earlier? I would be very surprised if it didn't. Um, the, the good thing is that the fish were able to eat a lot more. I think there was more forage. The more forage was more active. I think the fish ate. I mean, I'm not seeing very many at all fish that are undernourished nourished on this river. You know, it's not like these fish have been active the whole time. They've been able to eat. I mean, the stonefly hatch this year is the best I've ever seen. I've yeah, never, it was incredible. Yeah. And, it, and I mean, there were days, I think Mike and I were on the water, not together, but on the water at the same time. And, and the stoneflies were, were two or three stoneflies deep. You would see pods of just Little mats, little mats. mats all over the place. Yeah, it yeah. was awesome. It was. It and was the really cool. The were eating them, and the bass were eating them, and the minnows were eating them. They're just. I think it. I think the warmer weather was was. It might not be as bad for the fishing as we might think. Now the spawn may happen earlier, and if the spawn happens earlier, we get a cold snap. What happens? So, you know, nature has this incredible way of rebounding. In two thousand two, three, four through two thousand twelve. We thought the river was was gonna, you know, was a, was a thing of the past. It was half the fishery it once was. It wasn't producing younger fish. We had this older population that we were catching, and yeah, we were catching a lot of trophy fish. But there was always concern of what is our next year, next class going to be. Mm -hmm. We had floods, we had droughts, we had bouts of culminaris, we had the black spot stuff. It was just, it was just all these gloom and doom. And then you could take into the the, the, the flathead catfish are going to eat every bass in the river. There was just a bunch of you know, frightful things, you know, and of course, you know, with all the, the drugs that are being taken these days, I mean, the, the legal ones, <laughs> do, our, do our systems, you know, in, in, in the water treatment plants, do they have the ability to filter filter these, these pharmaceuticals? And we know that they don't have that ability. So is it impacting the birds? Is it impacting the eggs? Is it impacting the fish? Is it impacting the forage that the fish eat? There's just so many things that are, that are out there. But I actually... Nature Chris, I actually seen that happen firsthand. Um, like uh, the one sewage plant, um, you know, was caught dumping raw sewage into, I think it was on the New Jersey side, actually, you know, into the Delaware. And 
Yeah, no, and and that was like uh, you know, I, it was a big thing, and you know, they got fined and and the whole nine or whatever. But um, I mean, I used to fish a lot out of Regalsville and like the afternoons and stuff like that. I mean, there were like drifts where it, you'd go and catch 12, 15 bass, no problem. And uh, after, two, I think it was like 2016 or no, 2017, I want to say. And it was weird the following year, I, I go to some of these little spots, you know, just go catch a couple fish after work or, or whatever. And it's like, there's no possible way I just caught three fish through here. There's no way, you know, and then believe it or not, you know, when I found out was that following year was that, you know, all that raw sewage and, you know, Chris and I, again, you know, talked a lot about it and it was that secondary byproduct and, and it made so much sense, you know, I mean, I'm not a biologist or anything like that. I mean, but like forage and, and, and I mean, and fry, I mean, existing fish, I mean, maybe they're, you know, tough enough to, to like, I don't know, like sustain, you know, whatever. But I mean, it, like it's, I seen it happen firsthand, you know, and it's we just, it's crazy. Too, right. We had that co-ash bill on the Delaware. Yeah. Up North a little bit further up. Yeah. Co and, yeah. And, and, yeah. Yeah. We had a coal, literally the, uh, we actually, had, yeah, we actually had a, a, a power plant had a coal ash pond too close to the river, and it yeah. blew it blew out the dikes and it went into the river. And I mean, it it left a slick in the river for miles and for weeks. And gray, and, it and was gray. gray. Really, it was gray. Yeah, you would see where the grass, you know, the, the forage, and the grass was where the coal ash didn't hit. It was vibrant, and where it hit, it was dead dead it was just and it took years for it to rebound but it rebounded i mean i remember thinking yep. okay, this is going to be catastrophic and believe me it, it wasn't a good thing but we're we're already seeing some of these areas improve you know and i'm talking about the area you know below the coal ash thing and you and i know like is not yeah. as it once was yeah not like exactly that, but you know if you and i are going to fish the river even today we're going to fish an area above that course. oh 100 percent. yep absolutely have you because it's, it's just not the same fish it really did impact it have, have yeah. you heard of this yeah. corporate credit system that they use to get to get away with all this crap i i actually did do some reading on it a couple of years I, ago i i had mark mark frondorth on the show he's the uh, shenandoah river keeper and he was talking about what they do is if you have that pond too close to you and they're like well we're gonna have to flunk you you can actually go in a corporate market and buy credits so that way you can pass and that's how they right. get around all this wow. stuff and it's like and honestly we even have corporate lawyers that will tell you listen it's cheaper to pay the fine it, than it is to fix this problem. it's in yeah it's in, how is that still legal though like that's insane that hasn't been fixed. again it's people who are not they don't care about the environment they don't care about the resources they just care about the bottom line yeah and they're in these roles for such a short period of time that all they're trying to do is to keep their time there where they're going to save as much money for the company as they possibly can. And then they get promoted to some other position with another company and it's not their problem anymore. So it's just, they're going to look really good on paper for not putting that millions of dollars to rebuild that thing. And they're going to be out of that job in an, in an even better job. And it just perpetuates itself, right? It's, it's, there is something to be said about greed, right? I mean, there's yep. just this. And as long as they, it's not my problem anymore. That was four years ago. That decision was made. And, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like factories not doing preventive maintenance, mm -hmm. right? The guy that does the preventive maintenance always gets kicked in the rear end at the end of the year because he stopped the product line. He lost a little bit of productivity and, and, but his four years, you know, the guy next guy, the next guy who doesn't do it for four years he looks great because he doesn't lose anything. And the guy who inherits his problem ends up losing. So it's just being, not being a good steward of, of, of your responsibility. Yeah, and, right? I, and, and I think this is where I, I and that's why watch dogs like river keepers are so yes. critical. to watch Yes. Yeah. And they're such a great source. Um, I'm going to talk before the show. I, I have Rob coming up. Who's the, the president of the James River. And he's going to talk about the paper plan on the Jackson we're going to talk about too. Because um, it's so fascinating that you have these people and so many anglers don't know about it. Like they'll get on and bitch at me because I talk about flatheads, but they won't 
write to the Riverkeeper about problems they see. And it's just so ass backwards. It's like, come on, guys. Like, you can make a difference, you know, talk to Riverkeeper, talk to, to the DWR if you see an issue, something like that. Because, you know, if we have a spill or something like that, it affects everyone, not just not just one angler tribe. But now the other thing to switch to the more of the fishy stuff too is um, with that weather change, something I heard that was very interesting is when that weather, when you have a warmer winter and you have more bait fish, it actually can sometimes kill certain bites. And so uh, one of my friends said something that I thought was really interesting that he thinks that, well, because they're not going to have a major fish kill, a major shad kill, he doesn't think the swim bait bite's going to be as good because there's just too many bait fish there. He's going to have to adjust it. It, it. If Do the Emerald Shiner, if it has a warmer winter, does that affect them where they're going to have more of an explosion in their population come the spring? And will that affect how you present baits to bass? Um, and that's a rabbit hole question. <laughs> I would say, I mean, I would say you'd want to probably stand out to be completely honest with you. I mean, so that's where I would kind of definitely play with my size and, and different stuff like that. I mean, when it comes to bait wise, um, I mean, in that type of situation, I mean, Chris, wouldn't you agree? I mean, I, I, we're going to catch fish one way or the other, right? So it, <laughs> yeah. does, it, does it mean that I won't be able to match the Emerald Shiner? And I'm not I'm, that that a color like, you know, I think everybody makes one. Uh, a silver flash minnow is not going to be as effective this year. That's very possible. Right? Hmm. That's that's very likely and very possible because already this year I've seen larger pods. And it could be because the water's clearer and lower than it normally is. But I've seen larger pods of emerald shiners than I've ever seen before. And it's not, you know, it might be in part that I'm on the river a lot more, but it's also because the river really, we didn't have that snow melt. We didn't get a lot of precipitation this year. And the river's kind of low for what it would normally be at this time. Um, but I can't get over the, the amount of invertebrates, like these insects and stuff that are hatching on the water I mean, it always happens, right? You always get a couple of days when it's warm and you get a huge stonefly thing. But I mean, it's every single That's day. That's awesome. And it's it's not just, I mean, it's not just a few. I mean, I will get into my truck and have to knock off. I wear a lot of black this time of year because I want the sun to warm the, the clothing. And I'll literally have to knock it off before I even think about opening my car or the truck door. So, I mean, I... I watch all the minnows eating it. I watch all the birds eating it. And you pick up a, a bass and it has, you know, it's got crayfish in its stomach. It's got, you know, it's got small, uh, uh, small minnows in its mouth. And it's got these little, looks like little potato chips, black potato chips all over the roof of their mouth from these stone flies that they're digesting, right? So just, there's just so much food that, you know, maybe, maybe it would impact the trout fishery. Mm. because they are okay. very hmm. picky but smallmouth bass will throw something discard something it will it will evacuate something to make room for something else right it is it is the roman empire right i mean how many times have you caught a smallmouth that throws up something that was larger than what you're presenting right it's like so they had a nine inch minnow in their mouth seven inch minnow eight inch minnow in their mouth and it took this tube and it couldn't fit it in its stomach. So I had to, I had to, you know, evacuate that to make room for this. So I, I just don't think that smallmouth bass are going to have a problem feeding on uh, minnows. You might have to pick a different color, like Mike said, and, and like you you were saying before, it might not be as good with the same baits. You might have to get more clever with the color scheme or something that's brighter or the way you're presenting it. But I still think that we're going to have just based on, you know, the, the, the jerk bait bite right now and the swim bait bite right now. I mean, it's today it was second to none. That, that, that is interesting because when I, when I heard that question, I almost went back into my head of like, so the years that was good forage, did I actually use more hot colors? And then the years that there was less bait, I actually had to use more natural. Like it just, I try to build these patterns, like these, these patterns of the history in my head. Here's the really weird thing right now. The river is relatively clear. It does have a little bit of stain. It's not gin clear by any means, and it's not low, but it's not high. And so the person that wanted to learn the jerk bait, I was trying to explain, I tied a bunch of different jerk baits on to show them profile. This jerk bait will be better if, if we're in less than four feet. This jerk bait will be better if we're in more than five feet. You know, and 
and I showed them different body sizes. Well, one of the two baits that work today, just because this is what the rods he picked up, where one was a hot steel, which is bright the colors, right? Very, 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 it looks like nothing in the water at all. And the other one that worked was very minnow like. I mean, anybody that this was anybody going into the store to buy a lure was going to buy that. Huh. It looks just like a minnow, beautiful colors. I mean, it just, it's very muted. It's not bright in any, and they just gobbled that thing up. And then I'd say, oh, I want to fix the, the hooks on this one. This one's got a bent hook. I want to replace the hooks. While I'm replacing it, he's throwing this parrot colored hot steel, which has always worked in this river, but it's dark blue on top. It's got like a, fluorescent the orangey bottom and then it's got some kind of i would say chartreuse in the middle it doesn't look like anything that's on the river and it, in clear water it still works huh. and we had to work the baits extremely slow today even though the temperatures weren't that bad but that means that bass is looking at that bait for a long time going i'm going to eat that easter egg <laughs> right because it doesn't look like anything else in the, in the river i mean there's no crayfish in the river at this point in time that look like that it's blue, it's yellow, and it's orange. And they ate it. And I've seen a true parrot collar work just fine. So, like I said, I, I think that there are bass that are opportunistic, and you're going to catch those bass. And and if this is the way that they're responding after an incredible year of forage so far, mm -hmm. I can only hope that it's going to be just as good the rest of the year. But yeah. I would be more concerned if I was a trout guy because I think that the bat, the trout are far more finicky. Interesting. About they're used to getting certain certain this. If there's extra of it, why you're going to have to go to extra extra steps to make sure that your fly is perfect and that you're placing your fly perfectly. Smallmouth bass. I mean, I could be I probably get hate mail for it, but I think they're one of the easiest fish to catch. No, no. I mean, I but they're pretty easy to get. A hundred percent, especially in rivers too. You throw that in there as well. I mean, I, th I definitely think like lakes, smallmouth are a little bit of a different animal. Um, yeah. How they behave. Now you mentioned, I don't know, did we mention this on the show or before the show, glide baits that you, you, the show. <laughs> you decided that that's going to be added to your repertoire this year and you're going to use it for smallmouth. Yeah, and, and I, have a, I have a mutual friend that's been throwing them and I've been really interested in them. So about two years ago, I started to throw really big swim baits. I mean, monstrous things. I mean, talking soft plastics, but they have built in hooks in them and they're, you know, they're, they're very, they're, they can be anywhere from 15 to $40. Oh, you're talking like mag drafts, um, those big, yeah, yeah. Okay. Big, big things that you would throw mostly for musky yeah. and stuff like that. But I've been thrown to see, Hey, you know, when these bass really start to put on that feed bag end of March all the way through, you know, the, first three weeks of April. And then likewise in the month of, of uh, November, early, early December, when they're literally whacking some really big, you know, chub suckers that are literally seven, eight, nine inches long and they're eating them and they're piling them up and they're, they're gorging for the winter. I started throwing these things and sure enough, I mean, it, it, it did, it doesn't, those bass don't shy away from it and it will turn some of your, little fish off don't don't think you won't catch a 14 inch fish on a seven inch bait though because they're crazy They'll, they will attack it <laughs> um but you're probably not going to get those 12s or 10s or something like that so the glide bait interests me because like i said to you before i'm trying to get that 40 inch pike i've caught a lot of big muskies and i've caught a lot of pike in pennsylvania but i've never really caught a big river pike and I, to me that is anything over 40 inches on the river so while um, if I got clients that want to, and I don't mean I want to catch them, I mean I want one on my boat, right? So while clients are going, you know, we got a bunch of fish in the boat, it's summertime, um, what can we do to catch bigger fish? If we have this glide bait figured out, it would be neat to see, you know, I've got four inch, I've got five inch, I've got six, I've got one seven. So it'd be interesting to see what the reaction of these bigger fish will be when you have a good population of pike, musky, and larger smallmouth, will a bigger bait work as well in, you know, from June through September, like it does when you're throwing it, you know, in the early spring, late fall. So I've added it, you know, it cost me a couple hundred bucks to get, to get them set up. And then of course I needed the rod and mm -hmm. the, to set up, but I'm anxious to try it in small fish season, meaning, Generally speaking, it's, you know, your average size in my summertime goes down pretty, 
pretty much because I think the bigger fish are less active during the hot water. They might be only a, you know targetable for a couple hours during the day. But could you coerce one to eat a really big bait in the summertime? And I'm I'm not talking about the fact that small baits are important because they are. I mean, we watched that young man win the uh, the oh the Nolan Minor, Nolan Minor, yeah, on a on a spider, like a topwater spider. Yeah. yeah. So now, it, did you have no. any like like so any ideas like on how or presentation wise how you're going to work that thing or any tips for it? Have you gotten out at all yet? Uh, Right now in the, in the summertime, like I said, my friend Bill is 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 really kind of he's kind of taking it full 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 speed. So I'm kind of trying to catch up to him right now. Um, we're working it very slow. Um, we're we're finding that it, it it really kind of needs to be on a sinking line, like you would for your fluorocarbon. Um, we're looking for a slow a slow um, sinking. Seems to be working better. Um, he's playing with two segments. I'm playing with three segment baits, um, and we're just just trying to get a handle on how hmm. how it work. My thinking is we have a lot of shallow flats in the morning that will hold big fish. Oh, they're very spooky, um, and you get one or two shots at them, and then they move off into what I'll call ambush areas that are in deeper water. But I've seen these fish come up and smash live bait that's bigger than what I'm throwing. I would think a two but joint. I, can't see what yeah. I was saying, like, I think two joint would probably, if I had to pick, I like what you said with two joints versus three. I just like that bigger S that it that it does. And, and you look at them side by side in the water, and they do they do seem to. I'm not playing with both, but they do. The the two seem to be a little bit easier to work too, because if you work the three too much, it kind of collapses on itself. It doesn't look as natural. But yeah. I mean, you can sink a lot of money into these crazy things. Oh, dude. <laughs> just want to see, I just want to, I mean, I, I have a lot of opportunity when I'm during the summer. Um, I do, I have a lot of opportunity to fish evenings because the days are so long, mm -hmm. right? So I, it's not uncommon for me to go out for two hours and throw the fly rod to get better at that because I'm terrible. At oh, it. you like that? Oh, I love it. because Anything that it can, it can improve a skill that I don't have. I mean, I write because my mind is really math-based. And I'm a terrible writer. So to, to improve my writing skills, I try to pop out one or two articles per month for magazines so that I can exercise that part of my brain. The, the math part of my brain doesn't seem to need it as much. And likewise, I can throw a spinning rate, spinning rod or a bait caster with, without even thinking about it. But, you know, you throw an eight weight fly rod in my hand and I'm some days okay. And some days I'm disastrous. So you know, I, if I'm going out in the summertime by myself, that's usually what I'll throw. Mm -hmm. But if I have the opportunity to, to take this bigger bait out, I'm not out there to, to really catch a bunch of fish. I'm just out there to see what I can, you know, it would be for two hours. I could take a bass coming up and look at it and go, okay, I got to change it. I got to do better, right? So if I don't catch a fish, it's not the end of the world in the two hours and evenings that I have to try, especially knowing that 90% of the fish are going to think that's too big to eat. It is interesting to me, depending on your bait type, how much the color and the presentation matters, where I think with a jerk bait or a tube, you could be a little off, but with a big swim bait game, it just seems generically speaking, the damn thing has to be a photo image for the sucker or, or, or the shiner. Like it, you can't. I, I really wish I had the background to share what I read, but I believe it was a Berkeley study that happened that said that fish over a certain size are least likely to be caught again. Right? That makes so, sense. There was, there was something that was, they were talking about, like, you know, between the ages of zero to eight, largemouth bass were more prone to be caught and caught and caught. But once they reached a certain age, they were difficult to catch, which is why it's so hard to catch one of these 10 or 12 mm -hmm. pound largemouth in some of these great fisheries, even in Mexico and California and Florida, right? That they're known for really big, they have to fool them with, you know, live bait. So we know on the Susquehanna, everybody's catching these, these big, big, big fish. But what if five, five and a half isn't big? Oh, what if there's something bigger on our rivers? What if there's a six or something like that? That's possible. Yeah. We know that we've seen stories and people have caught, I mean, Jeff Little, I think caught a six on the river a couple of years ago, but what if there's more to it than we actually realize? Right. I mean, we're, we're, 
I mean, what do we know? I mean, shocking a river is very difficult, right? I mean, the shocking studies that they do, the way that they do them, I don't know that it that it can produce all the fish that that really would be interesting. And it'll be interesting with forward facing sonar as as people start running that on the rivers and using that as a tool um, to be able to catch some of these more finicky and snipe some of these smallmouth. Um, Jeff, I had Jeff on the show a couple months ago. <coughs> Excuse me, and he talked about he went snorkeling because that's Jeff in the river, and he figured I've done it with him. I have video of him and I doing it. <laughs> Fifty. Years. I'll have to see that after we, we get done recording. Um, but he talked this idea of territorial wolf packs of like a big smallmouth, and it makes sense when he said it. Like it'll stay in a section of river, and it has a rotation of spots it'll do, and it, it makes sense that if you had a big dog smallmouth, like. If if you're moving too much on the river, you might miss him because he might not be there at that time. You almost have to like camp in an area and specifically hunt his home. Have you ever fished with Jeff? No, bucket list item. You owe it to yourself to do it because I consider myself a patient person until the seventh or eighth hour of fishing. With Jeff. <laughs> so I would probably go absolutely insane. <laughs> Right. And <laughs> That's what you're saying. <laughs> it takes a very scientific approach to to fishing. And, it, and there's times when Jeff will want to fish just a small body of water because he's seen a big fish in that area. Mm. So and he will fish for that fish. It's like a it's like a, a, a true whitetail hunter hunting that knows yeah. that, that 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 if I stay here all day. For a week, I'm that 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 whitetail is very very su- you know sure to come by, but there's a lot of dead hours in that mm. you know dark to dark, and you get there two hours before, so you don't spook him. You leave two hours after. It's a commitment to that ten pointer that you know is there. Jeff was has been that way when I've been in the, in the water with him with fish because he knows not only is it a big fish spot, but there's a particular fish I'm after. Right. I'm after this fish that I saw and me, I'm like, move on. That thing is gone. Right. But he will literally fish an area. That's awesome. Until he breaks it down. And, and but it's, it, it takes a level of patience that, I mean, in the winter time, I've seen him throw very, very, very large jerk baits in, in really, really cold water. You know, usually I'll downsize to like a 78, you know, to, to try to entice a few more bites where Jeff will stay with this massive thing at, you know, 35 or 34 degree water. And I've seen it work, but I've seen him catch two fish all day long. Right. So it is a, it is a dedication that I think few of us have that kind of patience. I don't, there are times when I just don't, it's like, you know, you've thrown 300 times to that rock, let it go. Right? <laughs> and then the 301st time he hooks up. So it's, if you, he's, he takes a very scientific approach to, 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 to what he's doing. And it's, and it is, I mean, we've snorkeled, we've flipped rocks, we've videotaped, we've done a lot of that stuff. And there is something to be said about it, but he takes a very scientific approach to it. I wonder if it's his farming background. I'm I'm not, I'm not sure. He definitely has a passion. I mean, I can remember him saying, I want to fish the Delaware but I don't want to fish anything that has a warm water influence. Huh. And I'm going, but Jeff, if we go to where the warm water influence is, Mike, you know what I'm talking about. It's yeah. <laughs> no, nah, right. If we go there, there's two and a half miles of, of area that we can fish and catch a lot of fish and, and we'll go out and catch four bass, but he's happier knowing that he didn't have the influence of the water. And I'm like, but it was the nicest day in the winter. Why? <laughs> <laughs> uh. so it's just, he's, he's just, he pushes him. I mean, I remember <clears throat> backing out on a trip with him and I'm on video doing it. I open the door to my truck on the highway. Cause I, I heard a noise. I was making sure my kayak was still on a boat and the wind was blowing so bad. It hyperflexed the door of my vehicle. So I actually literally had to eventually take the, 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 the hinges off and, get new hinges because it hyperflexed everything. And I said, I'm not going on the river in 45, in a kayak in December in 45 mile per hour winds. I'm just not going to do it. And then, you know, he and Juan actually did. And I don't remember if there was any success that day. It's just like, I'm not, not going to put myself in this level of jeopardy because, you know, and he, it was, 
he was really cool about it. It's like, this is your decision. You're going to do it, but I, I want to do it. I've also been on the river with Jeff when the river was at Harrisburg at 17 feet in a kayak, right? And catching fish. Good God. So, <laughs> but you have crazy. a boat. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very extreme, very talented, but I mean, he is a guy that is dialed into that event, that situation, and he wants to do it because he wants to make sure that he can, that it's something he can do. I have so, got to get you two on a show together to talk. Good Lord, that would be a bucket we list. Are, we are polar opposites in a lot of ways. I think that we're, we love the fishing. We love the science of it. But Jeff is literally willing to pick apart. You know, I, I will throw 400 times with spot. I mean, I'll, I will pick up and move. I'm not quite as fast as Mike, but I will. <laughs> So one thing I did want to yeah. do, because I don't want to keep you guys for like 20 hours. Um, how do you guys differ then on your bait presentations this time of year? Are you guys feel like you're pretty in lockstep with that? Or do you guys feel like you have your own little signature to it? Oh, I think that, that I think that Mike has Mike's energy level. I can't match. I mean, he, I can't match Mike's energy level in a conversation, let alone fishing. So, I mean, there's just certain, there's just certain things that Mike will he will dial down the bait and the location at any cost. Meaning if Mike's on the water, I'll give you an example. So someone will say, where, what's the pattern? I have been on the water for five days. What's the pattern? And I'll say to some people, I'll say it's current related. And then they'll go ask me 20 more questions about trying to get the exact presentation, the exact spot. The, you know, I can remember telling Mike about the Juniata. I said, just go up river. So if you get in trouble, you can float back to where you're going and, you know, worry about this ledge here, but anything else, go figure it out. And I'm catching my fish on jerk baits, right? And coming back and never being on a stretch of river before, Mike saying, yeah, we had a really good day today. You know, we had 70 bass. And I'm going, we only had 65 on my guide trip, and I've been guiding in this area for quite a long time. That's pretty impressive. And then he said, I'm up here. I'm up. I thought you launched here. He goes, I did. I said, what are you doing 25 miles up river? Like, I mean, that's even far from me. So I, I think that Mike, you know, Mike, I like really good equipment. I like giving my clients great equipment. I think Mike is a step above that, right? I think that Mike is about having really good equipment. If it means having 20 of the same color mega bass jet, uh, jerk bait in his boat and then 20 of another color that he knows works that's the way mike's gonna run and if you lose it you lose it yeah right? I mean, and so i think that when mike is looking for that fish where sometimes i'll go you know 60 is enough you know mike's gonna press that last hour and just you know try to get that mike that, that's a that's a great <sighs> We all know if you're fishing a river, you don't have to rethink the wheel and throw like this square rubber tentacle ice cube that this Japanese angler did it. Like, I think it was like Lake Eufaula. It's a jerk bait. It's a two. Right. It's a Ned rig. There's another one. It, one if bait. you have those yeah. four or five baits, you have a pretty good idea that you're going to catch something. And now we're just fiddling about colors. No. But oh, let me finish that. Um, yeah, go ahead. The Mega Bass one. I think it's a brilliant jerk bait. Is it really that important to have that specific jerk bait? And guys, I know Jake sells it. I, I think it's a really good bait, but it's like, is it us telling us now that we need this bait or is it literally built that much better? Quality of bait wise, I haven't cut in half, say, for example, a mega bass and a, a, a lucky craft or a whatever. So, I mean, and I've busted bills. I mean, I've fit, Chris and I've been together where I've busted bills off of jerk baits, Chris, right or wrong, you yeah. know. And I mean, I don't. It's really. Uh, it's tough to argue with how well. And, you know, and, and you know, I mean, when, before we were on camera, I remember when we were kind of talking about like even just like confidence, or maybe we were on camera. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, I mean, like at the end of the day, I mean, if if confidence yeah. is is just and i mean don't and actually in march 2021 i actually fished to delaware and um i was on a really really good jerk bait bite really really good and i said you know what let me take this mega bass plus one off and let me try a lucky craft and i was catching a couple fish i throw the mega bass plus one junior back on 
and it was like a three to one, four to one difference. Yeah, I'll tell so, you this. And, are- right. And and even too, like nothing for nothing, could it have been just that day, maybe? But I mean, I just think it kind of even just comes down to the confidence. I there's mean, and some, also there's some days, there's some days where you you know, there there's some days where the fish seem to be tuned into a certain bait color, a certain bait. I mean, uh probably get kicked in the pants for saying it, but you know. One of the X-Rap colors is just phenomenal on the river. We mentioned hot steel, but rusty crawfish is just a rusty crawdad. It's really a good color too. And I can name out 30 other colors from four different, you know, bait manufacturers that I think are absolutely critical to have. But I've had days where that they want that color and they want that Rapala. And I've had days where they want that Lucky Craft. I mean, I've been with Mike or, or Bill or Todd or other anglers that I fish with, and it makes a difference. Um, but I don't think you can be so blindsided where you only have mega bass, right? Which, yeah, and which too, I have an array, but I also I just have way, way, may, way more mega bass than I do anything else. You know, I just can tell you this much: if it, if it, you know, if if it really works, I think we all want it. I think Mike's willing to take the chance mm-hmm. to try different things, right? Yeah. So what I'll do is if I'm looking for a swim bait, I'm trying to make I'm trying to find a good quality swim bait. But if I have a choice to buy a good quality swim bait that costs four dollars or five dollars per pack for my clients and be able to say, Yeah, you can buy these without breaking the bank. This is why I'm using it. It's durable, it's a good one. And Michael Fish, you know, a twelve dollar bag of five soft plastics because his confidence level is and it, it is a better looking bait it does produce really well but there is no mike's going to fish the best if he thinks it's the best he's going to be fishing it. so if you're on his boat and he throws a bait it's because he honestly believes it is the absolute best bait. yeah, yeah. And, and mike it wasn't about just like throwing the um the mega bass it's just interesting for example My it's bad. like with jackhammer <laughs> like everyone says like you have got to buy this 250 fifty dollar jackhammer it is completely the best and it's like <laughs> Okay, baits, I've been to ICAST, I'm going again, and I know baits buy fishermen, not fish. And so it's like, is 100%. it really worth it? And like, I, I know it's a good bait. Um, it's just so oh. interesting to me. Everyone talks about this. It's like, how much of it is we've told ourselves that versus like how much it produces? And I always think that conversation is interesting because Chris, something you mentioned is like, but then you mentioned color. And then my thought is with the Mega Bass, it's not about the color. I think it's about how the vibration and its movement in the water because i'm going to nuke everything that's why i think the spy bait works so damn well because it's it's how it moves it's just so different and that triggers it well you you get a lot of reason for reaction strike but there you know you'll get and here's what we'll notice mike and i'll be fishing and he'll be fishing one color and i'll be fishing another and he'll be going i just got knocked again and there's no fish on the end of this thing i just got knocked and i'll say maybe they want a different color or a different size and we'll we'll play with it a little bit and all of a sudden the one guy is still getting the knocks who hasn't changed, but the guy that didn't is really getting interesting. Hit. So it's the same bait, but you know, it, you, I've done this with going from a 65 to a to a 78 to a 100, or a 110 junior to a 110 regular, or and just play with darker colors, lighter colors. I don't know that it, it's always that way. Like today was a day where today was a catch day, right? The, my my day today was. You're going to catch. If you're in the right zone with a swim bait, a jerk bait, it doesn't matter what you're throwing today. Today was a catch day. But there are those days, and Mike and I have experience them on New York lakes and New York uh, rivers, where if you were in a boat and didn't have that particular bait, you were struggling fishing the exact same spots that we were. And yeah. We had, right? yeah. So, I mean, we've seen it where you know, you're down to 10 of them and you're just praying you know, that this particular mm. bait, because you have three days left, that you're going to be able to maintain baits through the end of the day. You don't care if you lose a ball at the very last minute of the day, that third day, but you don't want to lose them because it just seems like, and one of us is always trying something different, but it just seems like there's yeah. always that, you know, that one bait during these, you know, some of these bites. And I uh, believe me, I love it when they're catching them on everything because then it, it, it kind of takes away that persona that you got to have just this one bait. And I wish I had the answer for you because I really don't. But, you know, there's just times when I feel like, yeah, they'll eat anything. And other times it's like, wow, they really do want this profile. They really do want this color. I mean, I have that crazy, sexy violet thing from Kai Tech, and I don't, I've never seen anyone close to it. 
I mean, yeah. I mean, I throw the exact same, the exact same bait in the exact same size in a different color in the exact same hole, and you don't catch a fish. You take it off, put the other one on, throw it back in the hole, and it gets whacked. It's like there's something. They're playing head games. What it is? I don't even. I, I I talk privately to people and say, "Listen, I don't know. I can't explain it." So you know, a buddy was out the other day, and he's got one in his pocket, and he refuses to throw it. So he throws his. He throws, you know, his favorite tube. He throws his favorite swim bait. Nothing happens. He goes, ah, I might as well throw this thing. It's not going to work either. Throws it and catches 13 bass in a row. So it, there's something about that color that's just that's just mm-hmm. making this, these fish eat. And it, it, even, I think it goes beyond confidence for me, but when, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to give somebody a smoke purple something. They'll go, what in the world is smoke purple? I don't like it. I don't want to throw it. And then they'll catch something on it, and that's all they want to throw, right? So you can you can get stuck in that whole thing where you know it's it's is it overconfident? Is it you know is it a crutch? And we talked about that before, you know, where yeah. we get pitted into a, a position where this is my favorite bait this time of year. I'm going to throw this, and you know it, and you know, and for the record, we've done the jackhammer test. <laughs> we've thrown the jackhammer <laughs> with, with the other ones, and I don't know why. But that stupid, expensive. I, I know it's so I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, You can have two guys throwing, and they don't even know what they're throwing. And the one guy's catching. Okay, well, this guy's doing different. Switch the rod, and now the guy with the jackhammer is catching. You go, okay, maybe it's the line, or maybe it's the leader, or maybe it's something. And you cut it off, put it on the other guy's line, and the guy with it is catching. It's like I fear that somebody's playing with my head, but I just can't. Because <laughs> oh, you look at it and go, it's not it's that not. different. It's not. No. I mean, bass shouldn't be able to pick up that, that what is it, the vibration or whatever it is. It should not make that much of a difference. Well, it, I have them because it. I've seen it firsthand that it makes You might be the best person to ask this. Is it because the components, are they denser? What would, what would, the, what would be different about the components that would make the vibration different? Uh, again, I, I can't. I've looked at it. I've you know. I've waited. I've read the report. I feel like you've been up at midnight, just smoking a cigarette, staring at this thing, <laughs> trying to figure I'm it just out. Like, you know, why this that is Chris. <laughs> why, why does this five dollar one not work as good as this this other one does? I mean, it, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, I, I've even done some things where I've even played with the skirts a little bit on it just to see if if it you know what is it about it? They offer colors. It just I don't know why it works. I just. And I hate the idea that I can't figure it out. Because right? <laughs> I want to be able to do yeah, right. <laughs> something. Like, I just, you know, oh dismantling a twenty dollars bait to see what it, you know what works, why it works. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't understand it. I just know that it works. Well, and I wish it didn't. I wish it was the other way around. <laughs> yeah, Mike, you got any closing thoughts? Anything that that we didn't cover today? Now, the only thing I was going to add to, I mean, like. Uh, success for for me for example like water wise is like i watch those water charts like a chicken hawk i mean i'm already looking at them i i mean chris and i talk throughout the week i mean i'm looking at these charts on like a monday to fish for saturday already and you know stuff like that i mean I could look at a chart and I have eight of them on my cell phone right now that I just have to refresh for wherever I want to go and fish. And I could look at that chart and that number tells me every single thing where I'm going to start my bait selection, my, I mean, everything I, I like. And I mean, of course, you know, when you go out there, I mean, every single day, just like we all know is not the same. I mean, you know, in case you have to tweak something, but I mean, that number is absolutely everything to me and i put everything into that number Mm -hmm. so when people ask me all the time like dude your secrets and you know like i'll be honest too like the only other thing is angles like fishing wise is just like like angles of you know spots and whatever but like that 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 um that water chart is is just it's everything that i put everything into that thing you know and that's yeah and i I think that mike you you, you, all you have to do is look at some of your reports i mean i would i would say that you you do tend to be a big fish hunter, right? I mean, you're, yeah, you're, yeah. I mean, I love to catch big fish. If I have an opportunity, that's that's always what I prefer. But I'm also the kind of person that you know, Jeff Little and I had this conversation. It's like Jeff will fish all day for two twenties, and I'll fish and catch eighty fish and hope that there's two twenties, <laughs> right? And it, it's usually how it works, right? But 
I'm not trying to just fool them until they start playing these buy baits. I'm not trying to just fool the 20s. I'm just trying to get enough. And attrition is going to basically get me my size, mm -hmm. right? Now, you can't do that in some tournament situations because you only have limited time. But, you know, my approach to guiding, if, if I know somebody's a big fish person, I I will go to big fish waters. I will will throw spinner baits all day because I think that's, to me, that's one of the best baits for really big fish. I love top water. But I mean, I've caught some of my biggest smallmouth on a Ned rig, and I hate the Ned rig. I'm telling you, I hate it. I, I do not like the Ned rig. But boy, does that thing work. And I mean a traditional TRD Ned rig, right? I love throwing stuff on a mushroom head, right? I love it, right? Really? Micro jigs. Oh, my God. Well, I do not like throwing that stupid little cigarette looking thing. I'm I don't like the either. either, but it works. I just hate that damn mushroom head because it gets snagged on everything. I, I like. <laughs> I, I really like trying to find a finessey football heady thing because I don't know why they still just have that mushroom head and they haven't reinvented something that's a little bit more like rock proof. Uh, there's and there's a bunch of them that are that are a little better than others. I mean, there's there's I mean, I played with the half heads and I played with you know the gopher, the original gophers, and you know the Mike and I have talked about the Z-Man ones and yeah. you throw the ones that come from the Midwest, the Midwest molds and. We have certain keepers. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of them out there that, that we've all thrown. And there are some, you're right, there are some that just seem to be magnets. I, for I, I don't know how you guys would make a living with how much hardware you'd be losing if you had, like, the heads you well, go we, through. You, if my clients are listening, they'll laugh because sometimes I will literally take, I'll, I'll spool my lines to be three quarters full so that when you go to cast it, you can't overcast it because that's one of the biggest problems is first problem is to cast upriver in any jig upriver. You cast it up there. You have 50, 50 shot of getting mm -hmm. it. Back, right? It's you, it, it, it's, you it's gone. It's yeah, gone. gone. <laughs> you got a great opportunity. The other thing yeah. is a bomb cast when you don't need to be throwing a bomb cast because it, it creates your, your angle changes. And that's just a horrible thing. For that. But if you, you know, if you cast like a flip cast or if you're close to the fish that you can just, you can keep your angle on it so much better and kind of guide it through. But, you know, if, if I'm stuck fishing that net, you can bet that I'm pulling out the, the reels that have three, you know, guys will go, do you want to ever put line in this thing? He's like, nope. <laughs> and then I'll, get, I'll hand him up, you know, a, a spinnerbait rod or a jerkbait rod and the thing's full to the net, right? So why is this one like this? It's like, because I want you to throw a <laughs> <laughs> it's like training wheels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you, get you get the snoop people. Oh, wow. Oh, we can't top that. <laughs> guys, again, like I, this was a lot of fun. I enjoyed this. Uh, link in the guys, again, link in the episode description to but to all their information. Um, again, Mike, Chris, thank you so much. Uh, Chris, Real River Adventures, Mike, uh, Bronzeback Outfitters. Uh, Mike, I'll start with you. Anything you want to plug here sponsor wise, anything like that? Now, um, no, not really. Uh, no. And then Chris, your, your book for the next century, correct? <laughs> yeah. And I think Mike is too. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying, get, I'm trying to get Mike on board here just uh, to help me out a little bit on the river when, when we have it, but it, it's, uh, it's a wonderful river. It's, I think it's an easier river. We, we get a lot more credit for our own abilities. I won't speak for Mike because I know Mike is a superstar, <laughs> but this river no. makes things kind of easy for us. And, um, my goal if it's not catching fish, it's also to try to get along with as many people possible on the river and pass along a little bit of this knowledge before I pass on it. So, Jeez, it's, that's it's, dark. It's, <laughs> well, stay well, with us a little longer. I want to leave some kind of a legacy, and the legacy I want to leave yeah. is not fighting with everybody on the river, right? And if if I can help somebody catch a few fish, whether they're clients or not, I'm, I'm all for that, right? I think the youth in this country is what's going to perpetuate this mm -hmm. I mean, we've got we've got a lot of people on the river now fishing, and I think that you know one of Mike's and my issues is is how do you explain to somebody when they're doing something wrong that that's not good behavior, right? How do you yeah. teach somebody that you know that that's having a problem loading or unloading a boat and not pick on their ego by saying, "Let me give you a piece of advice on how to do this." I had this problem too when mm -hmm. I started it. Well, I didn't start. This is this is this trailer, right? And you you can't approach some of these people, or you know, you're in a situation where you have somebody do something 
where they come in and they cut you off. They might not know that they're cutting you off, right? So just trying to explain to them, you know, there's a certain bit of etiquette that, that's on the river without creating a fight or a problem, right? So it's it's just it's just a simple thing, that, you know. <clears throat> if you're a saltwater angler or obviously a person that fishes in Japan, fishing close is pretty much what yeah. we do, right? But on a river, when there's three boats at the boat ramp and there's not that much traffic, why do you have to fish the same island somebody else is fishing? And I think that would be a great subject for a future show would be about etiquette. Um, because I think... And I wish there was a way to approach people and not offend and, and, them, right? I wish there was a way to, 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 to say, you know, some days... You know, you just smile and move on like I did the other day because I don't want problems, and I really don't didn't think that that spot was really worth fighting. Over. But 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 it was but how just, old? Did the person know that they were doing anything? But how old were they? Right? Like, I mean, I, I think you're right. It's the next generation. You got you got to teach. And, and I don't know, and I don't want to. I don't want to blame. Yeah. Nothing made me more angry as a young man than when my grandfather or somebody would say, "Ah, your generation." Well, you know, just, but you do see it. There is some differences, right? Like you feel like you own, like I remember I had somebody come up to me. I have two different boats and they never saw the other boat. They came up to me and said, you're in my spot. And I said the person's name and he goes, is that you, Chris? I said, yeah. He goes, whose boat is that? I said, more importantly, whose spot is this? Mm -hmm. You know, because he thought that he could bully me out of the spot because yeah. it was a spot that he only saw me and him in. And then when he didn't recognize my boat, he was going to bully me out of this spot. And the crazy part about it was, it was 200 yards from a boat ramp. There is no such thing as a secret spot 200 yards from a boat ramp, right? There's nothing secret about it. And the Susquehanna River with, you know, 2,000 custom-made jet boats on the river, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm not exaggerating that number. I mean, there is a ton of jet boats on this river. And boat launches every six miles. Is there really that many secrets right now on this river? And do you own a community hole? that people have been fishing and for 70 years. I wonder if because of this younger generation being social media, everyone has a camera on, if they're going to be better about that or worse. Because it seems like, is that an older generation thing? Like, oh, this is my secret spot versus the younger guys. Like, well, everyone has a GoPro on. There's no such thing as a secret spot. Like, I don't know if that's a, if that's going to change over time and get better or not. I, I just, if I the just, generation is going to do it, I, I'm all Mike, for it. I mean, I, I would just like to see a little bit more cooperation. Sorry, Mike. No, I. Now I, I'll be honest. I just lost my train of thought. To be honest with you, my <laughs> we were, bad. We were Thanks, about, Chris. No. Will, will the social media crowd? make fishing better oh no no that's what i was gonna say so for example like i don't think that there's a secret spot on any river anywhere to be completely honest with you you know and there's a secret spot for a moment there's a secret yes bite for i a agree moment. with yeah there is that but it only lasts for a moment because i'm on the river every day and if i can tell you i agree there yes days, there are days when it works and days when it doesn't and there are days when this spot is absolutely have to be on it other days where you can have it because it hasn't fished well in two or three times out right so it's just it's just i just need <laughs> a little bit of patience with one another when I, we're out there because no, there's, I, just, I, there's I just so few black and white issues you know when it comes to this is working this is the spot this is you got to figure it out it's a puzzle every day what yeah. do you say mike I lost my train of thought again, bud. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, Thanks, let's. Chris. Um, yeah, I want to make that a an interesting conversation for a future episode. Is what you th if you were going to teach a high school fishing class, what you think the etiquette would be, and not not for tonight, but because like I know when I fished, I grew up on the tidal Potomac, and that place fishes like the Jersey Shore, where everyone is on top of each other, and you learned that's how you deal with it. But when I would go to lakes, people were mad, and then I had to relearn etiquette on lakes because it's different. It's a different culture. It's a different place. Like you said about saltwater fishing. So it would be interesting if you wrote a syllabus to teach kids, this is the etiquette on the Susquehanna. This is the etiquette here and here. Because I don't think we all play by the same rule book when it comes to that. And I think that might be some of the issues. Possibly. I think you're 100% right. And and I'll be honest, too. Like when Chris says sometimes, like, uh, what did you say before, Chris, about, you know, like, uh, it wasn't worth saying anything to that guy or, you know, like, right. But I mean, like, like it would be nice to like, kind of go back to the ramp and just be like, Hey man, you got a second. 
and just like i don't know yeah i don't know it's, there's it's, just... it's how to do it without being confrontational yeah. right it's how to do yeah. it without someone getting really upset at you, we'll right? see but I'm the pro Right. And the problem is, is everybody comes back to anybody with anything I feel anyway with, well, you don't own the river. Well, right. I understand I that, dude, but this comes down to a right. level of respect. So and like, let's just have this conversation, you know, it's a process. You could say, hey, how you doing today? Oh, I'm really struggling. I said, hey, we're really catching them on, on um, this bait or that bait. Right. Right. I mean, right. The presentation. And, and then maybe if you can remember the boat, remember the person. You might get an opportunity later to say, "Hey, I, you know, when I was fishing this 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 island on the left, on the east side, what was your thought process coming over and fishing? Were you just trying to check out to see what I was doing, or you know, what was going to happen when we were both at the end of this island after we're drifting it, right? And and we're both now fishing the same water. Just, but I, I just don't know how to do it with some people, even with some people that you know, without it being confrontational. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I've come up river and not seen a boat someplace." and pulled in and fished, you know, was fishing the same piece of water they were. And I've had to actually apologize or, or leave that spot without seeing because they were so camouflaged. I mean, some of these boats, these gray boats are hard to see sometimes when you're, you're coming <laughs> up and if they're in there and it's, you know, it's, it's, you're not always able to see it. And I've done it to kayak fishermen where I've actually rolled around, you know, putted up to them and apologized for saying, I did not see you coming up through here. You know, I didn't, you didn't have a flag on your boat. I didn't see you. It's not your job to put a flag on. It's my job to see you. But I swear to you, this was nothing that was done intentionally. I, I did not see you, right? And, or coaching them for for tying their boat off in the only place I can get through in the river. Mm -hmm. right? All the jet boaters are going to be coming through here, and you've got your boat tied off in it while you're waiting. And you, you've got to expect that since the, at this level, the only place boats can get through here, and this is more of a North Branch thing, where the only place a boat can get through here is where you're fishing. So – you're, you know, I'll blow the whistle for a few minutes, but if you're not going to move, you're going to be, I'm going to be close to you, right? I mean, obviously wouldn't run a motor, of course, but I'm going to be closer than I'm comfortable and I'm sure they're not comfortable with it either, but they're in the only spot that I can return back. So, you know, whistle, blow, and they look at you, what you're doing. It's like, you're in the only place I can come mm -hmm. to get down through here. You know, it's, it's, how do you do it without making somebody upset? And that's really the, I don't know how to fix that. Human behavior is a very difficult thing. Yeah, it um, really is. It really is. Guys, <coughs> thanks so much. Uh, again, guys, like and the... Uh, yeah, I know. It's been a long day for me. Link in the episode description, everything we talked about. Like and subscribe to the channel. Um, and we'll see you guys next time on the Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.